Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. The Siberian wind clawed at my face as I led my Navy SEAL team through the unforgiving wilderness. I am Joe, the drummer from a local band back in Kansas. Not exactly the typical background for a Navy SEAL, but I'd always found the rhythm of chaos easier to navigate when I was laying down a beat. Now I was marching to the drum of a classified mission in the heart of Siberia. Our intel pointed to a secret Russian base harboring something beyond our understanding. Unknown radioactive predators parachuting into the frozen landscape, we hit the ground with precision. The cold Siberian air filled my lungs as I motioned for the team to move out. We were here to uncover the truth, no matter how deep it led. Silently, we moved through the shadows, eliminating guards with lethal efficiency. The base loomed ahead, a foreboding structure in the desolate landscape. Once inside, the air grew thick with tension. We crept through dimly lit corridors, following the trail of classified experiments. As we delved deeper, we stumbled upon a scene from a nightmare. Scientists' faces contorted in fear, desperately trying to control a swirling mass of unknown chemical element. But control was slipping away. The room trembled with an otherworldly energy, and then it happened. The experiments went south, horribly south. The room convulsed as creatures, looking like the rake, a cryptid but more monstrous burst forth, fangs glinting in the dim light, fur matted with the gore of their creators. Chaos erupted as the creatures tore through the scientists, leaving carnage in their wake. Seal team, engage, I barked, my drumming instincts taking over as I fired at the abominations. Bullets tore through the air and the acrid smell of gunpowder mingled with the stench of death. The base became a battleground, a symphony of gunfire and guttural roars. Hours passed, and the creatures lay motionless, victims of our relentless assault. But victory tasted bitter as we realized something crucial. The chemical element we sought had vanished, stolen by an unseen group during the chaos. Disappointed didn't quite capture the sinking feeling in my gut. We called for evac, standing amidst the aftermath of a battle against nightmares. The Siberian wind carried whispers of secrets untold, leaving me to wonder just how deep the rabbit hole went. The rhythm of uncertainty echoed in my mind as the chopper blades cut through the frozen air, carrying us away from the heart of Siberian darkness. While working for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in 2017, I was assigned to investigate sightings of a particular deer in the South Cattle Moraine State Forest along the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. The description suggested that the deer suffered from chronic wasting disease, CWWD. There were three different reports, each stating that the deer was malnourished, severely injured, and had a terrible odor. My first thought was that the deer had been wounded and that gangrene had probably set in. The part of the trail where the deer was reported was difficult to access with a vehicle, so I ended up hiking. The sightings were near one of the public shelters. The most recent report was made about 24 hours previous. I reached the shelter just as a thunderstorm began to roll in. I looked around quickly for the deer. But the rain started to fall heavily, and I decided to wait it out in the shelter. The shelters in this area of the park are more like little cabins and used by backpackers. I took off my backpack and sat down. I was soon overcome by the stench of rotting flesh. It came out of nowhere, and it was so strong that I was nearly gagging. I looked around the interior of the shelter to see if I could find the source. Then I thought I saw something move past the doorway, but when I peeked outside, there was nothing. The stench then disappeared as quickly as it had manifested. I waited in the shelter for maybe another thirty minutes. The storm hadn't let up, but the stench suddenly returned. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew there was something terribly wrong. I can't explain how I knew. I just knew. I then heard something scrape against the side of the shelter. 
It was loud. I looked out through the window and I saw what looked to be white antlers. Now that didn't make any sense at all. It was early summer here in Wisconsin and bucks don't start growing their antlers until much later in the season. Even if they were early, they would still be covered in felt. I figured this must be the injured deer and it certainly smelled like it was on death's door. I tried to get a better look out the window, but the animal appeared to be moving towards the door of the shelter. Whatever it was, I was about to see it soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling, though that there was something off about this whole situation. I removed the gun, a 12-gauge shotgun with slugs. I had packed in to dispatch the deer. I pointed it at the door and I waited. The doorway was dark because of the storm, but I could still see well enough to know that the creature that walked into view wasn't an old injured deer. It was about twice the size of a full-grown male whitetail, and its body was absolutely skeletal. Its fur was long and stringy, like the kind of long hair you would find on a dog, and parts of it were missing fur completely. But the worst part was that its head was a skull. No hair, no skin, just bone with the antlers attached, and I didn't see any eyes in its sockets. I could see it had a tongue in its jaw, and its teeth looked like those of a deer. But the lower jaw didn't appear to be hanging on by much, and I don't know what the thing was. It was standing there in that dark, rain-soaked doorway before I fired at it. I hit that creature three times center mass, and it ran away. It was weird because it didn't fall down, and it didn't even falter a step. It just ran. I waited another hour for the storm to pass before hiking out of there. I had never been so scared in my life. If a shotgun couldn't stop it, there was nothing I could do if I ran into it again. I finally reached my truck. I had no idea what to report to my boss. I eventually decided to report that I never observed the deer. I thought that if I reported the truth, it would raise red flags about my competence. Not long after that incident, I found another position within the department as a conservation warden. In the fall, sometime between 9.30 and 10, 30 p.m., I had just finished spotlighting for deer. I returned home and decided to look for my friends who were hanging out by the old water company. When I found them, they excitedly told me they had just seen the creature. They explained that they had spotted it after hearing a strange noise, and when they shone their spotlight in that direction, they saw the creature standing by a telephone pole. Once again, this wolf-like creature was upright on two legs. It quickly darted into the woods, disappearing from their view, and they didn't encounter it again. The following day, we decided to investigate further. We used a measuring tape to measure from the ground to where the creature's head had been, just below a spike in the pole, and it measured a staggering seven feet. The Mercer County area had been a known hotspot for dogman sightings since the 1960s, with many reports originating from the Shenango Reservoir vicinity. I shared this report with CUE. In 2011, following a meeting of MAPS, Mysteries and Paranormal Society, during that meeting, I also described a series of other dogmen reports that I had personally encountered in the 1990s. I was out for a walk with my daughter and our dog in the evening, near a cemetery just before dark as a thunderstorm approached. My daughter grew bored and decided to head back to the vehicle opting to wait for me to finish the walk. While she was in the car, something astonishing happened. She saw a bipedal creature that looked like a werewolf, standing about five feet tall, with grayish fur and dark eyes, emerge from the nearby bushes. This creature boldly walked around our vehicle once and then disappeared back into the bushes. The most chilling part was that it made direct eye contact with my daughter, who froze in terror. When I returned to the car, I found my daughter hysterical with fear. I could tell she wasn't lying, and I believed her. We couldn't help but wonder if the approaching thunder and electrical storm 
somehow served as an energy source for this mysterious creature to manifest in our world or dimension. This cemetery was on the outskirts of town in a rural area with plenty of woods and creeks, providing a suitable habitat for such creatures. My daughter was emphatic that it was not a Bigfoot. It had a wolf-like snout. This area of Pennsylvania has a history of strange phenomena, and this encounter added to its mystique. My grandfather told me this story a couple months ago about a weird creature he encountered with his platoon in Vietnam. He said it looked like a Bigfoot, but different in some way. The story begins at Cam Ran Air Base in 1957. He arrived at the barracks and went right to bed because he knew the next day was going to be a long one. He awoke and joined his platoon. They started their patrol through the jungle when they found an injured ARVN soldier next to a tree. My grandpa asked him what had happened and the ARVN responded, It's still near. Get away from here, my grandpa was confused and didn't think anything of it. They put the ARVN on a stretcher and sent him back to base. They continued their patrol and everything was normal for a couple hour until they heard a loud deep scream type sound. They rushed toward it, guns at the ready. They cut through the brush into a clearing and saw a seven-foot-tall, hairy creature gnawing on bone. One of the men started to shoot at it. Bad idea. The creature lunged toward him and flung him into the air. The soldier crashed to the ground and screamed. The creature grabbed the man and bit into his legs. The other men started shooting at this thing. It yelped and dropped the man. The creature ran into the woods. A soldier ran to go help the man that was bit. The man's legs were gone and his spine was broken. The medic came over and put the man on a stretcher. They started their way back to base. They went about a mile before the thing came back for revenge. It jumped out of the bushes and snatched one of the soldiers. It dragged the man into the brush. All the soldiers started sprinting down the trail. My grandpa tripped on a rock and smashed his head on the ground, making him black out. He awoke the next morning with a huge gash on his head and blood all over the place. He started to get up when he heard large footsteps coming near. I laid her back down and acted dead. The creature walked by him, thinking he was dead. A few minutes later, he got up and started walking, but soon he realized he didn't know where he was. He walked down the trail for a while, hoping to find someone from his platoon. He walked for hours, but he eventually found a helmet. He turned it in circles and found that there was a hole through the middle. He walked a little farther and found what was left of his platoon. All the soldiers were dead, but the medic was nowhere to be seen. He grabbed a gun and continued hoping to find the medic still alive. He walked for a couple miles when he began to think he was never going to find the base until he found a map. He grabbed the map and looked at it for a while. He figured out where to go and started walking. The next morning, he arrived at the base. His clothes were ripped and his face was bloody. After they got him cleaned up, my grandpa went looking for the medic. Eventually, he found the medic in a tent. One of his arms was gone and he had scratches all over. What happened, my grandpa asked. The medic responded with, I ran and ran with that man on my back until I collapsed. And a patrol found me. My grandpa went and asked to go home that day. My grandpa was changed by this. He's been going to therapy since. I've asked around and no one seems to know what that thing was, and my only explanation was Bigfoot. So last night I was driving home around 3 a.m. and I passed by a suburban intersection. Look left, look right, and turn back, and wait what? For a fraction of a second, I saw a humanoid creature sitting cross, leg hunched over with its back towards me. It was bald and hairless all over. I couldn't reverse to have a second look because there was a car a few paces behind me, but I watched it turn right and the driver just kept going, as if nothing was there. After a slight hesitation, I got out of my car to check the scene and it was nowhere to be seen. Anyone have any ideas what I might have spotted?
In 2001, my sixth grade teacher told our class this story about her childhood growing up in Texas. I don't remember the entire story, but I do remember a few things and would like to know if anyone has ever heard of this. This would have been the early 1970s somewhere in Texas, but I am unsure of the city. She said there was a house down the street from hers that was abandoned. There were newspapers piling up in the yard, and the property was unkempt. For some reason, she decided to break inside the house to explore. She broke in through the kitchen window in the back of the house where she could go unnoticed and landed in the kitchen sink. There were tons of empty bottles of mane and tail shampoo scattered about. She came across a creature that she described as part horse, part woman. Apparently, she saw the creature from behind first, as she described seeing the back of a woman with long, lustrous hair. Once the creature turned around, she said it had a leathery face, huge teeth, the body of a woman, but horse hooves. She ran back out of the house, frightened. Something strange happened a few weeks later. Apparently, there was a man who lived at the house, or at least owned it. It seemed that he had been harboring the creature in this house. There ended up being a chase that occurred with a man and creature trying to get away and law enforcement in pursuit. This story was told so long ago, I am forgetting some of the details, but this story is so bizarre it stuck with me. Has anyone ever heard of such a creature? Hi, so... I've had a couple encounters that have left me feeling crazy and super off. I live in central New York, which is where each of these happen. So several months ago, I'd say probably around February or March, I was at a park with one of my friends after dark. We had gone there frequently and nothing had ever seemed weird. My friend was standing off to the side of a shed a few hundred feet away from me. I was sitting in my car. I had been zoned out, looking at stuff on my phone. He had been talking on the phone with someone. It wasn't until I heard this strange barking that didn't sound human or animal-like, per se. I couldn't figure out which direction it was coming from. The sound seemed to be coming from every direction. I looked up and saw my friend quickly walking down the hill before coming to a dead stop mid-step. When I looked around, I saw out of my side mirror. Something stand up from all fours from behind my car and sprint off way too quickly into the surrounding woods. My friend came running to my car, getting in and locking the doors before saying, Did you see that thing? It wasn't human. It looked like it, but it was way too tall and skinny. It had ran up behind your car and then when it was going behind your car, it squat down on all fours and then got up and ran off. The second encounter. This happened a few months after, right around the start of spring. I was with three of my friends and one of their dads. We were in the middle of the woods at one of their campgrounds. They had gone off for a walk probably 20, 30 minutes ago. I had stayed back to watch the fire. Suddenly the world had gone almost silent. I almost felt like I wasn't even in our world anymore. It's hard to explain. I heard this woman screaming, No! No! Help! Someone help me! I had just sat there staring at the direction that I thought the noise was coming from, which was deeper in the woods. At first I thought maybe it was one of my friends yelling, but none of them sound like that. Something had also been off about this voice. After a few minutes it trailed off and got quieter as the world returned back to normal. My friends had returned after another 15-20 minutes from a different direction than I heard the voice. So yeah, if anyone knows what these encounters are or has had similar experiences, let me know. I'm going to say I did not believe in alien abduction before this happened. I know it wasn't a dream. I was at home. I am lying in my bed writing a song. I was really depressed and didn't know why I was still alive and what was my purpose. I wasn't tired or anything, but I guess I must have fallen asleep or something. The next thing I know, I'm laying on a bed. It was hard and felt like metal under my body. I was naked. I could only turn my head a little looking around. I saw beings, gray but not short. 
They were tall, I'd say around six feet or more. They had eyes the shape of almonds. They had no clothing on. They didn't walk. They moved so smoothly. I started to panic because three of them started towards me. All of a sudden, I get this voice in my head to turn my head to the right. As I'm turning my head above me are these tubes that weren't hard but like rubber. That wiggled. As I finished turning my head standing beside me was this tall being. The head was gray. It had almond-shaped eyes, but the body was like a liquid. It told me not to be afraid, but it didn't speak it. It was like it was in my head speaking. All of a sudden, I get this sharp, burning pain in my left ankle. I tried to move. I tried to do something, but I was being held down by some force or maybe paralyzed. Again, this main being came right over me and looked down at me. I could feel tears going down my face, in my head. I asked, why is this happening? It smiled, but I didn't see the smile. I felt it. It told me that I needed to say to them something. I can't remember what I'm supposed to say to them and don't know who I'm supposed to tell it to. After that, my head snapped to where I was looking up at these hanging tubes. One of them started to slowly come down towards me. As it got to my right eye, it went from limp and soft to hard, and it had a point like a needle. As the needle-type tube was about to enter my right eye, the main being put its hand on my forehead. The next thing I know, I wake up and I'm looking out into space. I'm in a smaller craft, looking at a larger craft. But it was all hazy, like I was drugged. The windows on the big cigar-shaped craft looked like swirling water. The next thing I know, I'm laying back in my bed two hours later. My left ankle felt like it was on fire. I put my hand down there and felt a mark. It was diamond-shaped. It looked like it had already started healing as a scar. For the next week, I had a hard time walking on that foot. It felt like something was burning inside my ankle. This occurred in Massillon, Ohio, on 8-11, 2014, at around 6, 15 p.m. Nine years later, I still have the diamond-shaped scar, but it is very light. I don't know what they did when they stuck that tube needle into my eye. I really want to find a way to remember what I'm supposed to tell them, whoever them is. Ever since this, I have become a recluse. I want to know what happened to me that night and why they did these things to me. Will they visit me again? What do they want? When I was about 16, I wasn't feeling the best one night and decided to go to bed early. Sometime during the night, I woke up out of nowhere and was feeling really groggy. But at the end of my bed, I saw a shadow that looked to be wearing a cowboy hat or one of that shape. There's a window across from where my bed is and the curtains were closed. The moonlight was shining through very faint so I could just make out the shape. I couldn't see any features. When it happened, for some reason I wasn't scared, I just thought it was my brother for some reason, but maybe that's because I was half asleep. I just asked, why are you in my room? And he didn't say anything. He just slowly moved back a few seconds after towards the corner of my room, which was completely black until I couldn't make it out anymore. It's like it just faded into the darkness. Right after this, I just fell asleep again, and looking back, I don't know how I could. I woke up that morning and the first thing I thought of was what I saw and that's when it hit me how stupid it would be for my brother to be in my room. That late wearing a hat, I asked everyone in the family if they were in my room and of course no one was. I thought I might have been dreaming but I clearly remember waking up with a headache and still being half asleep and the fact that I remembered it that morning and the feeling I got in my heart when I realized what happened. Especially considering, I can never remember my dreams. Any thoughts, Eddie? This was in Ireland around 2016. This was about 16, 17 years ago, but my brother, myself, and a couple of friends were out driving around on a country road one night around Jefferson County, Indiana. It was about 2 a.m. and we were heading back to our house when this creature ran in front of the car. It was probably about the size of a chimpanzee, 
white fur, long arms with the head shape of a canine. This thing is burned into mine and my brother's memories and the memory of two of the other people who were in the car that night. I'm curious as to if anyone else has seen or heard of anything like it. I've pored over numerous posts and articles about cryptids and can't seem to find anything that really matches it. Also weird point, but the way I always described it was if the mongoose bike mascot from the 90s was a real creature. Edit. A lot of people have suggested Dogman. I don't think it was. This thing was short, maybe fourth tall, like I said, body similar to a chimpanzee. Very muscular and could most likely walk bipedal. But while it ran was using its arms as another set of legs. This happened many years ago. I lived Maryland in a little suburb type community. My bedroom faced the road and my parents faced the backyard. We lived in the middle of a cold deal, sick so you could see a lot from my bedroom window. Late one night I got up and headed to the bathroom. When I got back in bed I heard knocking at my bedroom window. I was on the second floor so I knew no one was knocking on my window. I thought it must have been my cat. I rolled over and tried to fall back asleep. There was more knocking, only this time there was a pattern to it, like shave and a haircut. So this was definitely not my cat. It was from outside. My door was on the other side of the room, so it wasn't anyone inside. I got out of bed and went over to my window to look outside. At the end of the street was a light post and a giant oak tree next to it. This little creature looked like a real live version of Danny Devito's penguin, but not so dirty was dancing under the light post. It grabbed the pole when it realized I was looking at it, spun around it and jumped to the side and disappeared as his feet clapped together. It was super weird. I have no idea what it was. I've never seen it again after that. Not too much longer after that sighting, my mom passed away by her own hand. So I don't know if he had something to do with it or if it's just coincidence, and I'm still trying to place blame after 26 years. This happened in maybe 2015-ish in Ohio. I would be 16 at the time. My friend and I were walking home from a local park on the side of a somewhat busy street. Suddenly I saw a glimpse of something sprint across the road and over the guardrail ahead of us. The other side of the guardrail is a steep hill and densely wooded area. He asked me if I saw that and I was even more creeped out. He saw it too and we both described almost exactly the same. It looked bipedal, but seemed to be running on all fours. Had what looked like gray, ash-white hair all over its body and was fast as hell. We got up to where it would been on the road and saw nothing on the hill or in the woods down below. We kept looking around but saw no sign of anything before we just agreed that it was really weird and kept walking. About two years ago, I lived in an old house outside of city limits in western Alabama. Wild hogs are considered a nuisance in this part of the country, and thus are year-round game. The land wasn't mine, but it was legal hunting ground, so my landlord gave me and my friends explicit permission to take care of any hogs we came across. So a lot of the time, especially during the winter when this encounter took place, I was posted up on my back porch with a cigar and a gun, either by myself or with company. This land wasn't very clear. In fact, we only had about 20 feet from the porch to the tree line. Then it would go down a hill and the brush would get thicker. So our hunting was just being quiet and looking for the beady eyes of hogs in the foliage when we heard rustling. So all that being said, one night during my porch sitting, I heard some rustling. I started scanning the woods for this hog and eventually did come across a set of white beady eyes. They weren't a hog's eyes, though, because these were eye level with me. As my eyes continued to adjust, the rest of the creatures started coming into view. 
It was tall, thin, and had long, spindly arms and legs. Its entire body was completely black. I couldn't make out any other facial features besides the eyes, but what I could make out was that this thing was actually a good ways down the hill, so the fact that it was still at eye level with me meant it was likely around ten feet tall. It started up the hill moving towards me and I had this feeling in my gut that 45 caliber bullets probably weren't going to do much here. So I slowly collected my things and headed back into the house. It didn't make any sound as it moved other than a slight crunch of leaves. As it climbed the hill, it somewhat stopped at the tree line, then turned and walked along the edge of it. It bobbed and lurched a bit as it walked, kind of how some large birds bob their head as they move. That was the most terrified I had been in a long while, and as the title says, this wasn't the only encounter. My hunting buddies and I all saw it several times, walking through the trees a good bit away from the house, sometimes turning to look at us. My roommate that moved in later that same year once walked outside and saw it right up against the porch, looking right down at her. It never tried to attack anyone or even acted aggressively so we eventually stopped being as scared, though still very cautious, and started calling him Big Boy. I've told a couple other friends about this. One of them said the description and behavior matched something called a California Dark Watcher. I did my research, and as much as this creature matches up, this was on the opposite end of the continent. I'm still not 100% sure what it was that I saw, but I am 100% sure I saw it. Multiple people did. Edit. Typos, and also forgot to mention that the woods went completely silent every time we would see it, even the bugs. Things normally get quiet when there's a predator in the area, but I mean complete and total silence. Edit 2. All right, you guys talked me into it. Give me a couple weeks, and I'll be back out there with some trail cameras. Hopefully, I'll catch something on video after all this time. Edit 3. Update. Just spoke to my old roommate that saw it up close. She said it was more eerie than downright scary. It looked at her like it was curious, tilting its head to the side like a dog when you're holding something it wants. My hunting buddies and I all saw it from 30, 50 feet away, but she ended up being closer than all of us. She confirmed no features other than eyes, but it had sunken in spaces on the face where there would be features. I understand her not taking a picture. I wouldn't take a picture of a bear if it was ten feet from me, let alone this thing. I was doing a delivery for work about an hour ago from typing this. The delivery was in Grove City. Pennsylvania, and the unloading area was right off of the one road in this particular part of town. As the guy started unloading my truck with his forklift, a couple other guys came out just to chat. The guy on the forklift points to the road and asks if he see what he's seeing. After I told him no and looked at the road, I saw it. There was a tall, broad man wearing a fluorescent yellow jumpsuit that resembled a hazmat suit. It was the same shade of yellow as the stereotypical selection of rain jackets or rain boots. Keep in mind that it's hot and sunny outside today. He was wearing black boots, bulky black gloves that looked like ones you'd wear in snowy weather and one of those 95 type face masks. All of his skin was covered except for his eyes. This alone was strange, but his behavior was also very off. He was walking in a very exaggerated manner. It almost looked like he was dance, walking. He stopped when a kid about ten years old happened to ride by on his bike. He stopped the kid and started talking to him. One of the guys helping unload my truck loudly told us to check if he knows that kid. After that, the man and the boy go in opposite directions. The man then stops, looks at me, and waves. It was hard to tell, but it looked like his eyes were squinted as if he was smiling a really big smile under his mask. I didn't wave back and just kept watching him. He walked by the guard shack in front of the unloading zone, which blocked my view of him, and then he was gone with no trace. The road was open with no surrounding woods or intersecting roads nearby. 
It would have been extremely obvious if he came out from around the shack. I walked around to find him and even looked again as I was driving away, but it was like he was never there. What could this have been? Was it some creeper criminal? Was this something paranormal like the grinning man, an extraterrestrial or maybe interdimensional being? It wasn't just mind tricks because at least five people total all saw the same thing. This story is from the time when me and my boyfriend started dating. We are both into supernatural things, weird things, creepy things. It was December 2021. We are from a city in Romania called Bodosani. Usually when we were hanging out, we were driving for hours, sometimes parking and just watching videos. In this particular night, we decided to go to a village 20 minutes as a way. Mandristi. It was around 12 a.m. We usually were hanging out only at night because of the work and school. We planned to park in a field, put a blanket in the trunk, and stay there watching the city lights. We have been there before, and we felt some things, like being watched, but decided that we were paranoid and didn't think much after. We did the same with the other things we saw on our dates. Anyway, we arrived at the field, parked the car with the trunk facing the field and the dashboard facing the exit. We got out and put the blanket in the trunk. I want to mention that I get scared and spooked easily. I always feel scared in places that I don't know very well. I started to feel like something is wrong and we shouldn't be there, but I ignored the feeling and proceeded to sit in the trunk. As I looked to the lights of the city, I started to also make a human figure out of the dark field. I called my boyfriend to come closer and look. He didn't see it at first. It was when I got really scared and starting to get in the car that he saw it. He got scared too and got in the car quickly telling me that the figure was coming towards us. I can not remember if we left immediately or not, but I think we did. I can t remember because we returned to that field many times since. The figure that we saw was a tall black, fog-like figure. When I say tall, I mean like a man and a half tall. We didn't see it since, and there is one detail that I can t remember for sure. One, because of the panic, and two, because we had many situations like this one. Not only encounters, but also just moments when we felt like we were stalked. We felt like we shouldn't be in certain places. And before anyone says that we really shouldn't be in certain places, we know that, and most of our stories happened in really random places. When we go to more sacred places, we are respectful and take precautions. Anyway, I can remember if one of us saw or felt like this figure was watching us. And when I say watching, I mean like it had glowing eyes. However, it might have been only our imagination or the city lights that gave us the impression of eyes. Also, it was not a man, because if it was he would have come to the car and tell us to leave or bang in the windows until we left. My boyfriend just told me one thing that happened the same night, and for some reason I was thinking it happened another time. So we left the field, and as soon as we got on the road, we noticed a spot on the road. I parked the car, my boyfriend got out first and looked. He said it was blood, but I didn't believe him, so I got out to see for myself. It was blood. The thing is that it looked as it had fallen from above, if it makes sense. The road that we were on has trees on one side and the other, but not on this exact spot, because there was the entrance to the field. Also, it couldn't have been a car that killed some animal that was crossing the road because there was no animal and no cars have passed since we arrived. No lights, no engine sounds, nothing. What do you think it was? Has anyone had similar encounters? And should I post the rest of the stories? Hopefully this is the right place to post about it. It happened when I was in high school, either 2015 or 2016 of May 6. My best friend at the time, our two guy friends, and I went to a small concert and decided to go to a residential park after to chill or smoke a little weed. 
This was in Huntington Beach, California, in a pretty wealthy suburban residential area. We sat at a bench and were just hanging out and chatting like normal teenagers. No alcohol or heavy drugs or psychedelics were involved at all. It was a pretty large park. There was a soccer field right in front of us, and behind it was a hill that led to a residential neighborhood on top. This part is really important later. Since there were no lights behind the soccer field, the hill was really dark and hard to see. All of a sudden, we saw four orange lights trailing back and forth in an S-shape down the hill. And there was a this sound that resembled almost like a dinosaur or animalistic snarl or something. We assumed it was the cops, so we started to stand up and back away from the benches towards our car. We were stalling to see what was coming towards us. As they came into the lights of the soccer field, we saw about five or six people in black hooded cloaks walking side by side in unison. They were also playing some eerie music from a stereo or something. All of them formed a circle, and one of them came into the middle of the circle, took off his cloak, was naked, and started hitting and stopping his chest really hard. I remember him being bald, very pale, and hitting his chest so hard that it was leaving pink marks on his skin. Then he blew a horn of some sort, which made that sound that resembled an animal's snarl. Then all of them turned around looking at us in unison and started sprinting towards us. I started to run, but for some reason my friends weren't really running at all. Then they started getting really close, and then we all panicked and ran into our cars. Once we were in our cars, they all had lined up on the sidewalk looking towards our cars, then turned around in unison and walked away down into the park. My friends and I parked our cars facing each other and called each other on the phone to talk about what happened. We assumed it was some kids from H.P. High School, which they nicknamed Heroin High because they are very interesting characters that attend that high school. We ended up just staying in the car for a couple hours, talking and trying to process that whole situation. Two hours passed, and it may have been 1 or 2 a.m. Out of nowhere, some sort of giant aircraft came out of nowhere, and it was flying above the neighborhood over the top of the hill. It looked like what a UFO would look like. I had never seen anything like it before. All of us were in shock. I looked over to our friends in the other car and all our jaws were dropped, and we did not say a word to each other. It wasn't one of those moments where someone sees a UFO hundreds of miles away in the sky for a couple seconds, then it just disappears. This UFO was just hovering above this neighborhood for at least a minute or two, long enough and close enough for me to roll down my window and stick my head out to study it. I remember the noise of the machinery, too. I remember seeing three red lights and three blue lights spinning in circles as it was hovering. I remember trying to study the whole aircraft and try to remember all the details. Then it descended down into the neighborhood and just disappeared. And I emphasize, this was a suburban neighborhood in Huntington Beach. There's no landing pad. There's no airport. There's just nothing that would allow any planes or aircrafts to land or take off. It just descended and disappeared, and we waited until 4 a.m. to see if anything would happen after, but nothing did. We just went home after and went to sleep. The next day, I did some research, and from what I can remember, May 6 was Walpurgis Day. Which is day? Uh, I tried to see if there were UFO sightings, and I remember seeing an article of someone reporting a UFO in Singapore or somewhere in Asia with similar red and blue lights. Could these two things somehow be correlated? I recently reconnected with my friend, and we got to chat about it years after it happened, and our stories are still the same. I ran into one of the guys a few years ago at an Outburgers. I literally just called his name. We made eye contact, and I said, Do you remember me? He said, Yes, then said my name. And all I said to him afterwards was, that day, that was real, right? I'm not crazy. And he immediately replied, that shit was real. We exchanged smiles. He grabbed his food and left. Could anyone provide any clarity on this? It happened so long ago and kind of just suppressed the memory. But it was very much real and finally searching for answers. 
Let me know. Thanks so much. No idea, but I'm freaked out. So to start, I know a decent amount about things like this, and I have a general idea of what they can look and act like. So today I wake up and it's only just become 4 a.m., so I headed downstairs to get a water and smoke a cigarette on my back patio. Typically my grandmother's dogs do not follow me or even really pay attention to me at all, but tonight as I'm on my back patio, both of them follow me outside and they freeze in their tracks. There's a corner between the garage door and the fence of my backyard and my bedroom window is just over the garage door. About 14 feet off the ground, I'd say. So my dogs are frozen in place and just staring hard at this corner. And then I begin to get that sinking feeling in my stomach that I'm being watched. My dogs have not moved from staring at this corner and I've only been outside for around five minutes at this point. So I start staring at this corner too. There is a tree right up against this fence in this corner, and I am very familiar with how it looks at night, but tonight, it looked off. I can kind of make out what looks like a person's head where their eyes would be just level with my window. The second I notice this, my dogs absolutely lose their shit barking at what I thought was nothing, and these are dogs that typically don't bark, not even for neighbors or postmen. At this point, I can clearly see that something is standing in this corner looking into my window, or at me. I went inside it and brought my dogs with me and made sure to shut the door and draw the blinds completely over it, and they have not stopped barking. I go upstairs and pretend that I heard and saw nothing, but as I look at my window, I can see the top of the head I mentioned earlier, just at the corner of my window, where typically there is nothing because of how high off the ground it is. It's too dark for me to clearly capture something on camera, but I am very sure of what I saw. I live in Texas at the edge of an urban area that they have only started expanding onto in the last 10 years. From the front of my house, it used to be miles of apple orchards and fields, and for the most part, it still is fields. But now they've started building houses here. I find this strange only because it's such an urban area. But I know there's no 14-foot people walking around peering in the windows. I can't say for sure what it could be, or was I only know what I saw. I've had previous experiences with things like this when I lived out in Oregon and rural Ohio as a kid, and only once or twice living in a semi-wooded areas in the panhandle of Florida. If anyone has any ideas or speculations on this, I would love to hear it. But for now, I'm going to pretend this didn't happen. Late, but I've got two quick ones. My friend and I were fishing in a 20 boat just inside the Skyway Channel in Tampa Bay. I lost my bait, so I set another shrimp on and half cast it over the side. The weight only dropped maybe six feet and started sliding to stern. I looked down and saw grayish-white spots. We were drifting, and there was a manta drifting along underneath us. It wasn't longer than the boat, but it was way wider. It hung out for a minute or two, then swam away. Not scary. I actually thought about diving in and swimming with it, but I didn't have my fins. Mask or snorkel? My friends and I used to gig stingrays and use them to catch big sharks in the bay. I'm talking full leaders and stout tarpon rods with big tests. We'd catch big hammerheads, 10, 12 FT, but we didn't dare bring them close. Just cut the line and start boasting. One night I hooked something. I tried to set the hook and whatever it was didn't budge. One of my buddies pulled up the anchor and that thing pulled us three, four miles at around two knots through Gandhi, bred straight through the center pass. Never came up nor dived. Never sped up nor slowed down. It acted like we weren't even there. We voted and decided we did not want to know what it was. So I cut my line. This was 30 years ago, and these guys are still my friends. Sometimes, if we're hammered, we still come up with possibility. Still haven't come up with a viable one.
The most terrifying night I have ever experienced was when my mother-in-law bought me a night vision scope for Christmas. We had a lot of deer that would come through the backyard. I shut off all of the lights in the house and opened up the back door, hoping to see a deer. What I saw was a full-blown skeleton in detail about ten yards away. I could see every little detail, ribs, eye sockets, teeth, and everything. The skeleton was noticed me, and it slowly turned its head and made eye contact with me. It transformed into a ball of energy and bounced away. I immediately walked to exactly where it was standing, and it was looking through the French doors to my bedroom as my wife was laying in bed. I lost my shit after that. I'm telling you, every bit of this is true. Cheers! Two things first, one not too weird because science, but at night if you look down where the wheel, big propeller that pushes boat, is churning in the water, these strange lights happen. Blue purple lights, I think it's static electricity released. Next, the matrix code, I literally saw it. Imagine a storm wind howling and blowing about 60 miles per hour. I was outside with my back to the house, where the bridge galley and bunks are. When the storms are that bad, you go right into the wind, so the back of the house is the safest place to stand. I was facing towards the stern, back. There was rain coming down through the sodiums, giant lights illuminating the back deck. The wind was blowing the rain at high rates of speed. This created that effect where it looked to be falling slowly. Mixed with exhaustion, the rain looked exactly like the Matrix Code. Not shitting you. Former Navy here. Huge storms where the waves towered over the ship, glowing oceans at midnight. But the creepiest is something entirely different. While underway, we always keep dark ship conditions at night. No exterior lights at all. Walking out on the deck at night, you can see every flash of starlight on the waves as we pass. One night I went on the deck for a bit of air and to watch the stars. I started to feel uneasy, like if a person is standing right behind you. I looked at the water, and there was a huge empty space next to the ship. Couldn't see water, wave tips, or even the frothy wake of the ship. Just a big oval dark patch. No sound, no light reflecting. Nothing. I stood there staring until it finally just shrunk and disappeared, like it had submerged. There were no submarines nearby, and it didn't make any splash, wave, or noise at all. I was in the sea as a commercial diver lifting rocks and pumping gravel on the west coast of South Africa on my first diamond diving gig. I was on my second working dive fresh out, getting my class. I mixed gas ticket in me and my new house. Maiden diver that took me under his wing were a little bit hungover for a 7 a.m. dive in shallow water. I was young. I could handle a hungover dive back then. Now it would literally kill me. Dehydration and diving is a huge no, no. Shallow water sucks for this kind of diving because there is plenty of surge. We were only a meager 15 meters on the bottom most of the time. The swell was so large that the depth would vary, meaning rapid equalizing and rapid exhalations timed with the waves, so that you don't get a bad ear. Squeeze or an embolism. When I jumped into the water, I was looking into a beautiful peeling barrel some 40 meters off. I remember thinking, WTF am I doing? Anyway, so this swell was providing an interesting challenge. We could not do our jobs because the suction hoses were flailing wildly, even when weighted down by drums filled with rocks. I had my legs wrapped around the pipe and held onto the handles near the nozzle, and it was a rodo on one of the Kraken's tentacles. My new buddy was worse off on the hangover and was doing the same. It proved too much for him, and something happened that I will never forget. As we were taking this crazy ride on the Squidotron 5000, I saw him take one hand of the nozzle and take his DV out and vomit into the water, put his DV. 
Back in gave me two thumbs up. In commercial diving, thumbs up means a okay. Motioning your thumbs upward a few times means you're going to surface. The cloud of puke was quite swiftly set upon by a school of small fish. Most surreal thing I have seen next to seeing a bull shark take a massive ship cloud next to me. I used to live in my parents' restaurant, situated at an airport for gliders, 15 kilometers from any city. So basically, it was just us and no one else. As we were not close to the city, we had and still have some unusual exchanges. Happening here, and sometimes even people coming to have intimate encounters in their cars. I happened to witness that maybe two, three times a year on the nights when I was still awake, but I think it may have happened more often than I realized. Now let me share the story. I'll use a heartbeat rate, HBR, to illustrate my personal condition. Normal April, a K, the chilling state. One night about ten years ago, when I was still a student, I was coming back from a friend's house between 2 and 3 a.m. in my car. At the time, I was driving an old Mini Mayfair. Both headlights weren't as bright as those of a new car, but it was still a cool car. I entered the parking lot just as I usually did and saw a big man standing between me and my house. I wasn't really scared because, well, I don't know. It's my home and I'm, I'm only about 15 meters away from it. I usually feel safe around here no matter what. I was more like, is this another strange encounter? So I went slowly in his direction. As I got closer, my car's light started to reveal that this dude was indeed really big. About two meters tall, I'd say. But he was also holding a shotgun. I froze up at that moment. The car was stopped, but the engine was still running. The dude started yelling something and pointed a flashlight at me. All I could think of at that moment was, should I ram into him? I couldn't see anything because of his flashlight. I stayed still and saw the flashlight moving closer to me stopping in front of my driver's window. He was still talking to me, but my brain unfroze, and I realized he wasn't speaking my language at all. So I remember slightly rolling down my window and saying pretty loudly, I don't understand. At this moment, two other flashlights appeared out of nowhere. I was starting to feel in trouble. Then the man at my window turned to his side and pointed his flashlight at his shoulder. That's when I saw it a G.I.G.N. badge on his jacket. Still bewildered about what was happening, I managed to stammer out that I was living here. One of the other men then told me, in French this time, that the man who had terrified me was a member of the Polish Special Forces. They, along with G.I.G.N., were conducting a night training in the area because the Glider Airport is also a state field. So they had the right to do so. Their mission was to secure the area while another group of G.I.G.N.N. and Polish Special Forces had the mission to infiltrate it during the night. So they let me go, and when I reached my house, I just stayed at the window, with the lights off, of course, and got to witness a real counter-strike action as a reward. The next day, my father told me that G.I.G.E.N. had come to eat at the restaurant the day before and informed him that they were going to use the restaurant and its surroundings as a training area during the night. As he didn't know I was coming home, he forgot to tell me. From that moment on, my dad made sure to inform me every time, and I even managed to sneak into some of their training sessions. They trained here about one, two times a year at our place, mostly during the night, but also once in broad daylight. On that occasion, the mission was known only to my father in the G.I.G.N. One person played a mafia boss, dining at the restaurant and being protected by two large bodyguards. The mission was to arrest them all in the midst of normal customers, which successfully startled everyone. My dad thought it would be fun to scare them as all the customers were regulars or friends of his. The job of Yosemite Park Ranger isn't what most people imagine. A lot of people picture us as law enforcement types handing out tickets and enforcing park rules, when really that's a very niche aspect of it. Mostly we're just here to assist you. 
handing out maps, not speeding tickets, and giving people directions to the best views or to ideal camping locations. We remind people about safety and weather conditions from day to day. But the main thing we do, and this is more vital than people realize, is that we're just here in case anyone gets lost or hurt. We deal with a lot of belligerent people who like to think the park is their personal playground, where they can do whatever they want. It's my job to remind them to follow the rules, to dispose of their trash properly, to pick up after the dog and to clip its leash back on while walking the trails. Some people take this as a personal assault on their freedoms, when really I'm just looking out for the safety of other visitors, like cyclists and horseback riders who share the paths. Dogs can be unpredictable and can misbehave on trails, and we have to look out for everyone. Still, I don't often get a lot of positive feedback for enforcing the rules. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Trust me, I get it. Every once in a while, something interesting happens to break up the boredom and monotony of the job. Last summer, I was walking around at night, doing a patrol of the campgrounds, when I saw something rustling around in the bushes. A guy came crawling out, dressed in a furry dog costume. I asked him if he was okay, and he just barked happily, then crawled away in the opposite direction. Shortly afterwards, I saw him chasing another person who was dressed as a cat, a woman who went scampering away and hid beneath a camper van, laughing excitedly and making purring sounds, licking the dirt from her fur pants with a long tongue. She saw me watching and clawed the air in front of her face, hissing territorially. It's not how I would choose to spend my Friday nights, but I'm not one to judge by far the most interesting thing which has ever happened to me at Yosemite occurred last summer. And it wasn't just interesting, it was utterly terrifying. Every night when I fall asleep, I have nightmares about that day. Every time I close my eyes, I picture those dark tunnels in the rock face. It all started when someone called in a report saying they were out on the Cathedral Lake Trail when their brother went missing. The pair had been out hiking when they got separated somehow. At first we thought it was just a routine mishap. People go missing in Yosemite all the time. It's no big deal in most cases, since usually the missing parties are found quickly enough. Half the time alcohol is involved and I have to remind people to pace themselves if they indulge while camping. But every once in a while those missing people don't turn up and we have to dispatch much larger search parties. In this case, I went out on my own at first, heading to where the man had called us from. I drove out on an ATV since it was a 16-mile round trip. When I got there, the guy looked frantic. He ran over to me and started speaking way too fast to understand. I told him to slow down and just give me the facts. It's important to stay calm in these types of situations. The guy took a deep breath and let it out. Then he started talking again, a bit slower this time. We were walking on the trail. He was right beside me. Then I turned around to look at the lake, and when I looked back, he was gone. Just gone. I tried to get a sense if the man had been drinking or doing drugs. It's not that I'm trying to assume the worst in people, but we have to think of these types of things. The simplest explanation is usually the right one, after all. And it was much easier to imagine the two brothers taking sips from a mucky and one of them getting separated and lost than to imagine one of them being abducted by aliens or taken in a very selective rapture. Slow down for a second. Take some deep breaths. What's your name? Let's start with that, Greg, he said, his face turning a shade less purple as he began to inhale air with trembling breaths in and out. Okay, Greg. I took out my notepad, jotting this down, along with his last name, which I'll leave out for the sake of privacy. And what's your brother's name, Dave? He said, sniffling. I saw you had been crying recently. Where was the last place you saw your brother? Let's retrace your steps. He started protesting, saying that wasn't going to help, but I convinced him we had to at least try. Greg led me back a little ways to where he'd seen his brother last. I walked back here already, and I looked all around here before calling you guys. I thought maybe he went off the trail to take a leak and tripped, hit his head, 
something like that, I don't know. I was grasping at straws, but I think something. He hesitated. Something what? I probed. Do you think something took him? Like those stories you hear about? He sounded embarrassed, but I tried to get more out of him and asked him which stories he was talking about. You know, you hear stories about Yosemite and other national parks. I'm sure you've heard about them, even if you're not in on the conspiracy. Stories where people go missing like this and it makes no sense. Someone turns their back for a second and their son or their sister or whoever is just gone, disappeared like Dave. I saw it on YouTube. Hmm? Huh? I replied, not sure what corner of the internet this guy had been visiting. Well, that doesn't happen around here, I can assure you. Let's keep looking. I'm sure you'll turn up. But the longer we looked, the less we found. It really did seem like the man's brother had just vanished. I was about to call in for more support. Maybe even a K-9 unit when the man yelled from a little ways off the trail saying he'd found something. Following the sound of his voice, I eventually came to find him at the base of the mountain, face to face with a granite wall. At first, I didn't understand what he was doing there, but as I got closer, I saw there was actually a cave which was well hidden in the rock face. It blended in perfectly with the mountainside until you were almost nose to nose with a pale gray stone. Good job, I said, patting him on the shoulder. But then I looked at our surroundings, getting nervous. We were pretty far from the path, in the thick part of the forest, which was overgrown and tangled with vines and shrubbery. Do you think he would have gone into this cave on his own? Greg looked around, as if checking to see if his brother had left a message for him. But there was nothing. I don't think so. It's not like him to just leave me on the trail alone, either. Especially not for this long. If this was a prank or something, he'd have come back by now. I can tell something's not right. Has your brother played pranks on you like this before? I asked. The man was in his twenties, and his brother was probably of a similar age. Young men occasionally got lost or injured trying to scare each other by pulling pranks or filming videos in the woods. It was rare, but it had happened before. Once or twice, he admitted. I didn't call you guys for a while because I thought he was messing with me. I wouldn't put it past him, but not for this long. I was getting annoyed. Mosquitoes were biting my neck and I was sweating in the heat of the afternoon after marching through the foliage for hours. I imagined the guy hiding inside the cave trying to scare his younger brother. Maybe he had fallen asleep in his dark hiding place or he was just pushing it too far, but either way I was upset. If this was a prank, it had wasted most of my afternoon. It probably annoyed me even more because I had my own older brother who had played tricks on me more than once in our younger days, and this was bringing back memories. All right, you can come out of there right now. I yelled, marching into the cave, thinking the young man would be hiding in the small alcove. I turned a corner and saw a dark tunnel leading deep into the darkest recesses of the granite. This made no sense. As far as I knew, there was no tunnel in this location, especially not one of this size. But it had been well hidden, nearly invisible in the rock face. I wondered if anyone knew about it, and I wondered if it was safe. I didn't feel comfortable going any further. The dark space looked like it went on for a long, long way into the distance, and I was getting an eerie feeling standing there. It felt like I could almost hear voices whispering from all around me. The words were lost in the echoing cave, and I got a strong sensation that we weren't alone, like icy fingers walking slowly up my spine. The other man came in behind me, marveling at the cave for a second before continuing to press forward. Come on, Greg said, forging ahead. He might be in trouble. He was anxious to keep going not scared enough of this horrifying place with whispering voices coming from the shadows, and his apparent lack of fear made me twice as scared. I'm going back for help, I said, shuffling backwards. It isn't safe. Nobody knows we're here. My training and my instincts were overwhelming my curiosity, but Greg seemed not to care about the dangers. The man continued going forward, disappearing into the darkness. 
A few seconds later, he was gone, and there was no indication he had ever existed in the first place. Greg, I called out into the black abyss. There was no response. He might as well have been a ghost. An overwhelming urge to follow him rushed over me, and I took a few steps forward, feeling hypnotized by that black tunnel leading on and on forever. But then I shook my head, slapping my face as I tried to wake myself up from whatever trance I was in, which was overruling my common sense. I turned around and left the cave, my legs shaking and my hands unsteady as I called for assistance. After meeting the search party back at the trail, we went through the woods again to find the cave hiding within the 10,000-foot-tall rock face of Cathedral Peak. But it was gone. I remembered having trouble finding it the first time and thinking it was well hidden among the pale gray surface of the mountainside. You had to be nearly face to face with the wall to see it since it was so invisible among the crags and boulders. I tried to tell my supervisor and the other members of the search party, but they didn't believe me. They said there was no tunnel there. They looked for hours and found nothing. Helicopters swept the area in more teams with more dogs, bloodhounds, and German shepherds. But nothing was turned up. There was no trace of anyone else having been out there except me. Dumbfounded for the rest of the week and for the rest of the summer, I couldn't focus on anything. My mind kept going back to that conversation I'd had with the man on the trail named Greg, the man who'd lost his brother and then disappeared into a cave that didn't exist. More and more, I began to wonder what would have happened if I'd followed him. It took a full year for me to build up the courage to go back out to that exact spot again. It happened to be on the same date and around the same time of day. Only this time, I wasn't on duty. It was my weekend off, so I had plenty of time to comb the area for clues. My backpack was full of provisions, and I had enough to last for a night or two in the woods. Maybe longer if necessary. Somehow I knew. I just had a feeling that if I went back on that day at that time, it would be there. The cave that didn't exist. Cathedral Peak loomed above me, getting larger as I made my way through the forest, moving toward it. The gray clouds above were shrouding the sun in darkness, while the thickening canopy blocked any remaining light from overhead. A chill ran through me, causing me to shiver involuntarily as I laid eyes on the black hole in the rock face, so plain and clear to see now. Taking a step forward, I found myself standing right in front of it, and I reached up my hands to feel the outline of the entryway, as if to confirm it was real. It was. I took a deep breath like a diver about to submerge, and went inside. The air was cold and damp with a strange, coppery smell. My flashlight was on my belt, and I grabbed it, but then decided not to turn it on. I was getting a strange feeling, like I was in an unsafe place, and needed to stay silent and hidden. There was a sound coming from up ahead which I couldn't place. It was a slurping, chewing sound like someone tearing meat from bones with their teeth. As I went deeper and deeper into the tunnel, the air became colder and so damp that I felt droplets of water running down my face and into my eyes. A trickle of light was filtering in somewhere as well, causing the cavern to faintly glow in places. The air seemed to shimmer and dance in front of my eyes as I went deeper and deeper, feeling entranced as I stumbled along in the shadows. Faintly, I realized that there was something wrong with me as if I'd been drugged, but I no longer cared. In fact, I found the sensation to be quite pleasant, and then I was abruptly awoken from my daydream as I came around a corner and saw the horror unfolding within the guts of Cathedral Peak. I can't possibly explain what I saw down there. In the shadows obscured most of it, drenching the monstrous creature in darkness. But the impression I got was of something like an octopus or a squid crossbred with an oversized plant or a fungus sucking and slurping, chewing and crunching something between its teeth. After a few moments of inspection, I realized it was a person's face that was being eaten, as the details could just barely be seen in the dim light of the cave. The skin was being stripped from its cheeks. 
The eyelids ripped off and the lips peeled back and slurped up like noodles. Tentacles like tangled vines were everywhere, slithering and sliding across the pale gray stone floor all around me. At first I thought it was mud beneath my feet, but as I came fully to my senses, I realized it was blood mingling and mixing with the dust beneath my feet, creating a dark, toxic red slurry which sucked at my boot heels. The tentacle, vine things were everywhere, I realized with numb shock. My feet were actually stepping on some of them, and I was amazed the creature hadn't noticed me yet. But it was obviously too caught up with whatever meal it was currently ingesting. Feeling very glad I hadn't turned on my flashlight, I began to back away very slowly, my boots crunching across the writhing tentacles. A sick knot in my stomach was rising up and threatening to make me puke fear and revulsion twisting my gut. My mind was spinning and my thoughts were racing, understanding there was a very good chance I would never leave this place. I tried desperately not to step on any more of the squirming, writhing tentacles which moved and twisted on the floor of the cave, soaking and basking in the blood which had been spilled everywhere, like pigs rolling happily in the mud. There was no possible way there could be so much of it, I thought. No one person has this much blood. This is like a river, and then I saw the others. They were hanging suspended from the ceiling, from the walls, from everywhere. Amidst the purple vine tentacles, they breathed in and out, still being kept alive, but just barely. Dozens of them were strung up and down the length of the cave, their chests rising and falling with weak breaths, but none of them opening their eyes or speaking. It was like they were sleeping. After a few long moments of searching, I found him, Greg, the hiker from the trail who was looking for his brother. He was hanging upside. Down from the wall just beside me, his eyes closed. Parts of him were missing, a piece of his cheek, part of his hand. But the wounds were slowly healing. The creature, whatever it was, kept its victims alive down there, I realized. It was ingesting them slowly, perhaps even using pieces of its other victims as nutrients to feed the ones who were dying of starvation, like an otherworldly pyramid scheme built of blood and human remains. Shaking that mental image away, I grabbed Greg's shoulder, hoping to wake him up quietly. His eyes shot open a second after I touched him, revealing only the whites, and he began to screech. And I don't mean screeching like he was screaming out of fear of pain or anything like that. This was an inhuman alarm cry which signified to me immediately that there was no shred out of humanity left in him. He was now a part of the hive mind of the creature and its tentacle army. As his head turned on a swivel, I saw smaller tentacles were wrapped around him, going into his brain and into his neck, invading his ears and eyes, and drilled into his spinal column. I screamed involuntarily, seeing these details, and heard the creature in the tunnel as it recognized my presence. It wasn't fast, whatever it was, but it was huge. The cave shook around me, dust and pebbles falling from the stone ceiling above as I backed away from the hiker. Beneath my feet, the vines were suddenly moving quickly, sliding around so that I couldn't find my balance. As soon as my shoes found purchase on the stone floor beneath me, I began to run. The tunnel was alive all around me now, the whipping vines twisting and bending toward me, reaching out like greedy hands trying to grab me as I raced past. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the amorphous creature's central girth was finding its way through the cave and was moving my way a lot faster than I would have thought possible. But then again, I wouldn't have thought any of this was possible before living it. The light of the entryway was just up ahead, and I could smell the fresh air and could see the sun. Then my feet suddenly slipped as if someone had pulled a rug out from under me and I went crashing to the ground face. First... My jaw closed hard and bit the end of my tongue, causing it to bleed, the taste of copper filling my mouth a second later. I tried to get to my feet. The mental image of those poor, trapped people could be seen clearly in my mind's eye. In retrospect, I think the creature, whatever it was, needed us to be unsuspecting. If we were aware of what it was doing, its hypnosis wouldn't work. 
Maybe it was a chemical it released, which caused people to want to explore the cave, a pheromone-like insects used to communicate. But it didn't work as well if you knew about it and if you understood its purpose. It released some more of that pheromone or whatever chemical it was using to lure people in, and I actually felt my legs grow a bit heavier. My eyelids, too. It was like I had suddenly just worked three night shifts and really needed to sleep. But then the wave of hypnosis passed, and I felt the rumbling of the ground beneath me, and that broke me from the trance again, causing me to scramble to my feet from the cave floor and run. As I neared the cave entrance and sprinted toward it, leaving my backpack far behind in an effort to lighten the load, I saw the rocks were actually closing in, tightening the gap. The entryway was shrinking somehow. It was the vines, I realized. They were what was camouflaging the entrance, their color changing to match the pale gray stone. I picked up my pace, the twisting forms beneath me, making it even more difficult. I didn't dare risk a glance over my shoulder, feeling the rumbling of the floor and knowing that the bulk of the creature was just behind me, closing in. With the gap of the exit narrowing even further, shrinking to the size of a dartboard, I dove head, first into it, imagining my face slamming into a sheer rock wall as it suddenly turned to stone right in front of me, sealing me in this dark labyrinth of suffering forever with the rest of the tortured souls. My eyes were squinted tightly shut as I felt the vines pulling and tearing at me as I went through the gap. For an instant, they squeezed in around my midsection, threatening to stop me like Winnie the Pooh after an unfortunate attempt at pilfering honey when I popped out of the hole and it sealed up behind me in an instant. I heard a loud crash as the creature flew headlong into its own obstruction. The trap it had created for me to keep me there had hindered its escape, preventing it from chasing after me. I could hear it thrashing and clawing at the vines, desperate for more flesh to sustain itself. Whatever it was, it was growing too large even for its own control. Left alone to feed in the heart of the mountain, it would eventually destroy itself. It would consume its own flesh to sate its monstrous hunger, like a snake eating its own tail. I had a very strong suspicion that it was true. With that very specific idea in mind, I wandered back to my car. It was easier now without the backpack and all the gear. But the walk back to the cave would be harder. There would be lots to carry next time. After a trip to the hardware store, I went back out to the trail. It was nighttime now, and the place was abandoned. I borrowed one of the Ranger ATVs and took my supplies out to the spot where the cave had been. After bringing a few buckets of water from the lake, I began my work. Since I had marked the cave, it was easy to find it again and to begin laying down the fast-drying cement. As park rangers, our job is usually to stop people from vandalizing mountains in this way, but I got the feeling Mother Nature would forgive me. It was my job to protect this place and the people who visited. And nothing could protect people from this thing. It was best to seal it away forever and let it slowly consume itself. Without a fresh supply of hikers, it would eventually run out of calories. It would eventually expire. It was only a matter of time. The vine tentacles squirmed beneath the layer of cement, groggily reaching out for me, trying to pull me in. I grabbed the trowel and slopped on another thick coating and watched as it rapidly began to dry. And the tentacles began to smooth out and settle down again, falling back asleep. That inhuman shriek could be heard from inside again, much louder this time, as if all of the hikers who the creature had abducted had all woken up at the same instant and for just a second realized their predicament. Sorry, Greg, I muttered to myself, alone in the dark forest. I told you not to go in there. The life of a park ranger often followed the gentle rhythms of nature, punctuated by the rustling leaves, the calls of distant creatures, and the soft sounds of the wind dancing through the trees. My cabin, nestled deep within the heart of Yosemite National Park, offered a haven of solitude and tranquility that I cherished.
One evening, as the sun cast its golden hues upon the land, I found myself rummaging through the old wooden drawers of the cabin, searching for a long-lost map. Amidst the clutter, my fingers brushed against something unexpected. I pulled it out, a faded photograph, its corners dog-eared, its colors slightly washed out by time. In the photograph, a group of humans stood alongside a towering figure, something that resembled Bigfoot, the legendary creature rumored to roam these woods. My heart raced as I turned the photograph over, revealing a date, 1930, and a set of coordinates, apparently pointing to a location deep within the park. Fueled by curiosity and a sense of adventure, I decided to follow those coordinates to see how that place had changed over the years. Armed with a backpack and my map, I set out early one morning, the forest alive with the songs of birds and the gentle rustling of leaves. Hours turned into miles as I hiked through the rugged terrain, following the trail as best I could. But as the sun began its descent, I realized I was hopelessly lost. Panic clutched at my chest as I reached for my radio, only to find that there was no signal. Desperation turned my footsteps into a haphazard dance, my eyes scanning for any sign of a trail or a way out of the dense woods. The shadows deepened and the trees seemed to close in around me, their branches clawing at the sky. And then in the midst of my disorientation, I sensed something watching me. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I turned, my heart pounding like a drum. Emerging from the depths of the forest was a figure that defied all logic. It was tall, about eight or nine feet, its form a shadow against the fading light. Its legs were long and skinny, arms even longer, nearly reaching the ground. Its body was rounded, connected to a long, slender neck that held no face. Yes, no face. The impossibility of what I was seeing sent shivers down my spine. Before I could react, the creature lunged, its movements uncannily swift for its build. It tackled me to the ground and I grappled with it, a primal instinct for survival fueling my struggle. But then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature melted back into the woods, vanishing without a trace. I lay there breathless and bewildered, my mind racing to process what had just transpired. And then, like a lifeline, I heard the distinct sound of footsteps approaching. My heart leaped with hope, and I turned my head to see another park ranger emerging from the trees, a flashlight in hand and concern etched on his face. He extended a hand, helping me to my feet. Are you okay? He asked, his voice a soothing balm amidst the chaos of my thoughts. I could barely find the words to respond. I, I don't know what I saw. It was a creature. Tall, no face. It attacked me. His eyes flickered with a mix of understanding and unease. I've heard stories. There are things out here that can't be explained. Together, we walked back through the woods, my mind still reeling from the encounter. He shared tales of his own experiences, of legends whispered around campfires, of unexplained occurrences that defied rational explanation. As we made our way back to civilization, I couldn't shake the feeling that the photograph, the coordinates, and the creature were all connected in ways I couldn't yet comprehend. The mysteries of Yosemite National Park were far greater than I had ever imagined, and as the night settled around us, I knew that my journey was only beginning. I was an infantry platoon leader in the United States Army at the time. My platoon and I were on a mission in Germany, somewhere around the junction of the Sick Republic, German border. We had been there for about two months, which is how long it took for our unit to transition from Iraq where they trained Iraqi police officers to Germany. We were patrolling the woods when we came to a clearing. I figured it would be a good place for my platoon to take a break from advancing through the dense forest. I went up ahead to scout out what was beyond that clearing. Something was troubling me about how quiet it seemed. Even the crickets, grass, and birds were all quiet. There was nothing but I figured it was my imagination after the long time spent moving forward without stopping at all. 
As soon as I turned around, though, they were all standing at attention behind me, their weapons pointing straight up in the air. They had obviously seen whatever had startled them. When I turned around, all I saw was the clearing that seemed to have no life in it whatsoever. So then I think maybe one of my squad leaders had probably seen something, maybe a deer or some other animal. So I asked them if they had just seen an animal. They all immediately denied seeing anything out of the ordinary and went back to taking their break. I was walking into the clearing to find where they had seen whatever it was that spooked them, and I had only walked about halfway across the open space when I heard everybody screaming over my radios, Move out! Move out! I, that's all I heard. So then I start running toward where they are. But before I'm halfway there, I hear automatic weapons firing up ahead in our direction. And of course, being combat soldiers, they are trained to be constantly vigilant of their surroundings. So of course they are firing at anything moving in the woods around them or taking cover behind trees or logs if nothing else is moving for them to shoot at. But then there were multiple things moving that they could see. Everybody started yelling, Enemy behind us! Or he's running toward you to your right flank. So everybody is firing in every direction. I finally get out there, and it turns out that my squad leader had seen one of these creatures run to the path only 50 meters away. He saw it earlier than everybody else, but at first thought it was maybe just another member of our platoon. He didn't see the face hidden behind an overgrown mane, but when I got out there I knew exactly what had startled them, and it wasn't any kind of animal like a deer or elk like I guess. It was another type of creature, but neither me nor anybody else could figure out exactly what it was, although I knew I just didn't want to admit it. We never found any tracks to follow or anything else that indicated there were more of these things around, although my entire platoon believes they were stalked by several of these things. So we figured this one must have been a lone hunter or something and got spooked when it got caught between both groups. About a minute later, the woods seemed to come alive with every type of woodland creature you can imagine scurrying from one side of the forest to another. It seemed they were all trying to get out from underfoot as either use or them passed through their environment. So maybe this was something. I'm not too sure, but I can tell you I think it was a group of these things that were about to attack. Had my entire platoon not shot at these things, they probably would have pounced, tearing my men apart. I believe they were acting in self-defense, and I think they were fighting against these bipedal canine animals. Something mauled a kid. I don't know what it was, still don't to be honest with you. What I do know is I'll be dealing with this until the day I die. I got the call a few months ago in the fall. I'm a park ranger, and while the brighter side of the job has you talking to happy families, helping send the wildlife back to areas safe from harm, there's a lot to this career that can take a toll on you. This was one of them. I pulled into a clearing of a forest in New Hampshire. White pines and firs as far as the eye can see. Autumn made the hue of leaves turn to a carnival of colors as red maples glowed in the sunlight of midday. It was walks like these that made me take this job in the first place. I even wanted to be a park ranger when I was a child. Back when I thought all you did was get lost in the woods, hanging out with bears stealing baskets. It had a way of making you forget it all, taking in the view, almost made forget what I was heading towards. The crime scene was at the end of a rocky ravine, trickles of water spattered on the floor a backdrop to the poor kid covered in a bloody tarp. He'll spare you the details, but I saw the photos sent for the report. Even saw the boy myself. It was awful. Whatever did this ate its fair share. Everything not consumed came in tears with ill intent, scattering his remains around the woods. The animal must have taken its time, shredding him to pieces. If there is a god, I hope that boy died quickly. The more I read from the coroner's report, however, the less I think it's likely. The parents were there to identify the body. The mother screamed seeing her child like this could be heard for miles. 
It sounded like getting her alive was preferable to the pain she suffered now. Ugly crying with snot dripping as a dutiful husband stood by, him using whatever strength he had left to hold her up, back from grabbing the pieces of her boy. Federal officers came in to assist us. All of us there were doing the best we could to ignore her screams of agony and get to work. Photos collecting evidence and the like. Believe it or not, people think we don't care. Unfortunately, most of us do. I even know how easy it would be for it to be your nephew or brother in that spot. Seeing his face ripped on the floor, it can keep you up at night. That doesn't matter, though. The parents crying would be far more distraught if they saw you weeping, too. So you bite your lip smoke, have a quick cry in the car when no one's looking. Otherwise, you just get back to work. In the middle of the commotion, I saw my old boss. He's an older man, stone-cut face from, from the wind over years of hiking. A stocky build with broad shoulders, yet held by the hunched, curving spine of a man who could say he was too old for this. The pot belly earned from long hours looking over files at the local diner hung over his trousers. Longer hours were spent drinking a fifth in his car to keep the nightmares away. He looked over the scene with that gravelly face deep in thought. O'Connell. I waved him down, stepping around the photographers and family to reach him. Jameson, good to see you. He gave me a nod and turned away from the scene. I followed after as it was clear he had something to tell me, away from the morning couple near. There was something to show me as well. He pulled a manila folder from his wool-lined jacket and handed it to me. Looks like you're moving up in the world. This your jurisdiction now. Yep, just move me over to Hillsboro. What are you doing over here? I thought you worked back in Concord. I took the folder from his hand. I had a hunch of what was in it and I wasn't looking until he asked me to. I do. A long time ago, this was where I started. Back when you could have a beer at lunch and nobody would bite an eye. I got a call about the situation and knew I had to come. This isn't the first time a kid's been taken. I opened the folder and sure enough, there it was. Black and white photos of missing children in the woods. Ripped to pieces, entrails strung among the trees. Whisker of which even in the faded ink was enough to make you sick. My old boss continued, We've taken trips to find it. No one's gotten a confirmed sight of the thing, let alone a kill. Sent 30 men 50 yards apart with enough ammo to put down an elephant. All we got was two casualties and a scream that still gives me nightmares. The old folks thought it was some kind of demon. A uh, curse on the white man for what our ancestors did to the natives when he sent them on the trails of tears. Can't say I blame them. I've seen how they live out west. We ship blankets full of smallpox and slaughter. They send a monster in return. You sound like you believe it. I tried to joke, yet any humor fell flat on the stone face that glared with a knowing tired. He stepped closer, pointing at the photos, staring into my soul, unblinking. I had to bury those children, put on the rubber gloves to pick up the bits. Parents didn't have the stomach for it and couldn't afford a coffin. The fear in those dead eyes haunt me in my dreams. Now, if you don't want to do the same, here's what I recommend. He gave me a list of instructions, the mother sobbing behind us now turning to an exhausted whimper. My pickup drove deep in the woods in wake of a setting sun. The camper shell and some tie-downs kept the load I was hauling as even then it bounced while I drove down the beaten trail. The farther I went, the less it looked like a road at all. First it was a lane, then it was a footpath, then there was none at all. I hopped out of my vehicle as the sky turned from crimson to a cool blue, the last vestiges of light shimmering in the trees. I thought I was lost despite following his directions with certainty. Fifty miles off the highway, you follow the runner's trail. When it ends, take a look around. If the woods are ready for you, they'll make room. I didn't know what he was talking about. Anyone else would have written him off as a loon. He trained me well, however. Back when I was fresh out of high school, kicking myself over a girl. He showed me the trails, taught me all the rules, even showed me how to shoot. My father died in the desert back in Iraq. This old man was closest thing to a dad I had. All in all, I owed him a little faith. 
I looked back at the gifts he left in my front seat, a pack of smokes and a flask with a small note unfolded. Reading it over again, I felt the mix of pride and pity emanating from his words. I'd go with you, kid, but I'm too old. Seen too many corpses of my own. Just do exactly as I told you, and you'll be all right. Help yourself to these when you're done. Congratulations, kid. You're going to need them. I looked around, playing with a pack of smokes. I flipped the lucky cigarette upside down like my uncle showed me when I was young. Third from the left. We all know smoking is terrible for you. Even so, it's funny the things that old men leave to those behind them. I looked up, just about to head back, thinking this was for nothing. Sure enough, however, I found what he was after. The thicket in front of me, a wall of saplings and branches, now had a break. It started small, yet as the sun went down and wine began to swell, the branches creaking as they gave way with all manner of twists and turns. It started slow, slow enough you would have mistaken it for just the wind. In minutes, however, the way was clear. The very grass and weeds lay down along the path, inviting me further in. I hopped back in my truck and drove slow. I barely pressed the gas as the clearing squeaked me inside. I always heard the forest was alive, a great organism among the cells of bark and pine. I thought him drunk, yet the old man was right. The woods made way to let me in. At the end of the path, I found a clearing hid from civilization. There in my high beams was a cement flight of stairs. No debris from a house undone. No foundation to explain it being there. A lone flight of stone steps railed with an iron banister, curling into the night above. The steps ended sharp as they reached into the sky broken beams of iron pointing like curled fingers to the stars glimmering high above. The air had a severance to it, like stepping before an ancient temple. My hands shook as I stood before the stairway. Nothing prepared me for what I'd gotten into, and yet keeping my composure, I walked around to open up the back. A corpse of a whole pig lay stretched across the truck bed. Its stomach hung open and flaps gutted as its blood seeped onto the tarp below. With all the strength I could muster, I pulled on the tarp as it slid across the bed of my vehicle. It took five minutes before my efforts answered with the heavy thump of the carcass landing in the woods. Thank God the stink was minimal, the heat from the vehicle only beginning to let it turn. I dragged it still further before the steps, those stairs drawing me in with a strange magnetism inviting to see them more as the contrast of that cold stone was so stark to the woods around. Without thinking, my hands even reached for it, yet the old man's words echoed in my head back from when I started. He was half drunk on a night watch for poachers back then, me too green to find it odd or even care. When he drank, the demons would come to haunt him, or maybe they haunted him still. The man only drawing from his flask could numb their fingers on his shoulders. In one of his rants, he told me plain, If you ever see a flight of steps here, don't even think of touching them. You'll never leave the woods alive. He pulled deep from the very flask now, sitting in my car, muttering to himself, I'm sorry, Phil. I shouldn't have left you there to die. I never questioned it then. Now I saw everything with a cold certainty. I snapped back to my senses, pulling my hand away. I climbed in my truck, headlights glaring over the pig carcass before stairs that felt more like an ancient altar. I should have left like I was told. Leave the pig in front, and don't come back till winter. Those were my instructions. That dead kid was still inside my mind, however. The sad look in my friend's face, his remorse weighed on his soul. I wanted to give those parents peace, every one of them. My hands gripped firm the weight of a cold iron, a black and gold revolver with caliber large enough to kill a bear. I waited for that predator to snap at my bait, sure I was the one to put him down. I turned off my engine, quiet to lure him in. For an hour I rolled my thumb along the chamber of that gun, waiting for the revenge I would take for all the murders it left behind. So sure that I would be their avenger, certain that my act was one of justice and not of pride. It's funny I only ever shot that thing at can. The loudest scream I ever heard shattered the glass around me. 
My alarm blared, filling those woods with the chaos that ensued. I screamed, covered in the broken bits of my windshield, but I did not run away. I did not cry or cower. Terrified still, my actions were that of pure adrenaline. Stepping out of the safety of my vehicle, I screamed into the night, raising my firearm, blind and deaf to all that ensued. I had no idea where it came from, yet I fired that pistol in those woods, again and again and again. Smoke from the burning powder filled my nostrils. Flash from a hot barrel blinding his echo and recoil had me stumble. My ears rang as the blast mixed with a siren now behind me. I fired until my chamber went dry, and that was when it hit me. I turned to see an open hand of black across my face. Its claw whisked like smoke and shadow, its color making even the night around us look bright in its comparison. The heavy thump of its strike knocked me down as though I'd been a child. My skull cracked against the ground and all went black around me. When I woke, there was blood across my eyes. Everything hurt as the world spun in my concussion. I reached for my face out of instinct as its painful sting awoke me. My fingers felt wet meat dripping with crusted blood. I sat up unsure why I could not see. One eye was full of haze, another I could not open. It wasn't long till I discovered I had no eye at all. The carcass was gone. Whatever that thing was had spared me, yet did not leave me unharmed. A warning to remember my hubris came in the surgery room, hours after crawling into my ride, finding my way home. Four long fingers on an open claw cut across the left side of my face. The index took my eyes, its smallest left a scar across my neck. The last missing the vein that surely would have killed me. Forever I will be ugly. The scars from the flesh it tore, unable to heal little more than the four canyon scrapes grinning like a Glasgow smile. I still work, still walk through those woods, still even make that drive once every season to that forbidden staircase, dragging a pig or deer sometimes onto the dead grass that lay before it. Now I treat the place with the reverence it deserves, leaving whatever roams these woods to its eternity. Ever since there hasn't been a single mauling, just as there wasn't one in the years before. Some might call it sacrifice, some ritual to appease an ancient god. Me, I don't know what to think. I just don't want to see more dead kids. What I saw was definitely human. Tall, slender, maybe 160 pounds, with locally tufted fur hair on the cheeks and face. He was panting and appeared to be a male. He came around the corner of our house at the backyard area, turned and looked directly at me. I had no sense of fear in what could be termed a standoff. The dog man's eyes reflected red light from the retina just like a real dog. This experience came at a time of meditation in my life and was one of many otherworldly experiences. This occurred about 20 to 25 years ago. The form was more human than dog and was bipedal. I worked night shift and a co-worker and I were both driving down a county road after work, probably around 4, 45 a.m., still dark outside. I saw his taillights get brighter like he was hitting his brakes. Then he swerves down into the ditch line and comes back out on the road and keeps going. As I approach the same area, I see this really tall black figure walking in the road. It's moving in a very weird, unnatural gait, like it was kind of blowing in the wind, but it clearly wasn't. I first thought it was a really tall person wrapped up in a big black blanket because I didn't see any arms or head just two big legs and a torso. I had to swerve over to uh, avoid it too, but I basically came to a full stop and the thing walks past my driver's window. It had to have been around seven foot tall as it was leaning forward and was at least a foot or so taller than the top of my vehicle. As it got behind my vehicle, I could see the taillights illuminating its legs, but couldn't make out any details like hair or anything like clothing just large, thick black legs. 
I took off down the road once it was behind me and saw that my co-worker pulled into a gravel parking lot, so I pulled up beside him. He's freaking out asking if I saw it and how it didn't have a head and other ramblings. I said we should go back and try to see what the hell this thing is because it seemed oblivious to us driving right at it. He didn't want to, but he ended up following behind me. We drove back the way we came and in around the same area. There was a large black dog laying across the road. This was not your normal size canine. It was much larger than any normal dog, but it looked dead. It wasn't there when we just drove through there less than three or so minutes beforehand. Anyway, I decided I was going to get out and go see if it's alive or not and move it off to the side of the road because you can't really drive around it without going off the edge of the road on either side because the way it was laying across the road. As I get about 15 feet away, it raises its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, but I still say that it was due to the vehicle lights causing eyes shine. It lets out a low, deep, rumbling, guttural growl, and I stop instantly. It attempts to stand up, seems like it has some sort of issues with its front legs, but it stands up and continues to stand up on two legs, like a person would. It only stood on its back legs for a second or two, enough time for it to look at me, but then it hunkers back down to what looks like on all fours and runs off to the wooded area. But there's a pretty tall fence there, so I don't really know how it managed to disappear because it would have had to go over under or through the fence or it just vanished i also don't think it was using its front legs when it ran off because i never saw them really moving now after all this there was one last strange happening my co-worker gets out of his car after the dog thing ran off and he comes up to me to basically say what foel was that and as we we're talking i noticed a mouse standing between us it was also on its hind legs, kind of sitting as it is washing its face. I nudged it with my shoe, and it doesn't even seem to care. Kind of like the first thing that was walking. It was completely oblivious to our present. It just kept on cleaning itself. We left and went our separate ways. I woke up later in the day and started looking into werewolves and come across dogman stories. The only thing I will say about all of that is this didn't have the hands and feet like is often claimed by witnesses. It had normal dog paws. It just had a large black wolf style look about itself. But its fur was really fluffy which didn't really seem to match with the normal wolf type fur. It wasn't a bear. It didn't have mange. I know the difference between a bear or something like that. It just looked like a very large black dog. The first thing we saw, some people said sounds like a Fresno Nightcrawler. But those have been white in appearance and not nearly as thick and tall. Someone recently asked if maybe it had wings, and that's what was concealing, its arms and head as if they were draped around the front of it. I never thought about that before and can't say one way or another because I didn't see any sort of details on its body. Just blackness. The way it moved just seemed very odd, otherworldly. I always think of those inflatable tube men that flap around in the wind at car dealers or some sort of events when I try to describe its movements. Just really weird. The mouse, that might be the oddest thing to me because I physically touched it. So I know it was real, but it just didn't seem to care. It wasn't until recently I made the connection that all three of the creatures were on two legs at one point. Are they all connected? Who knows? I never saw anything like that ever again, and I only live about four miles from where it happened, and I drive through that area often. I wish I had more answers, but all I get is more questions. As someone who's been pretty skeptical most of my life, I've tried to explain it away in some logical manner, but I can't. I have said the dog was playing with a mouse, must have got hit, and its front legs were hurt. That would explain why it was walking on its back legs and why the movement seemed unnatural. The mouse was traumatized from the dog messing with it. That explains why it looked all wet and why it was cleaning itself. That's the version I accepted for many years. The only problem with that is whatever was originally walking down the road was so much larger than the dog. 
When the dog stood up, it was maybe six foot tall, but whatever walked by my window was at least seven foot leaning forward. The walking torso was also a lot thicker than the dog, as the legs were very thick. The dogs were normal dog legs. On July 15, 2009, a team from PBS traveled to the location where the reported Bigfoot encounter occurred to interview the witness and to look over the area for any possible physical evidence. The team was comprised of Eric Altman and Peeb's members Dave Dragasine and his wife Cindy. Eric also invited me to go along to participate in the investigation. When we arrived on the scene, the witness and her husband were awaiting us. We went through our introductions and then walked over to the roadway where the encounter had occurred. The location of the incident was on a two-lane roadway outside of Uniontown. It was about 6 p.m. when the event occurred and the weather was warm and clear at the time. The witness was driving down the road at about 35, 40 miles per hour, when suddenly she caught out of the corner of her eye, a figure coming from the left side and approaching her. Her first thought was that a person was about to walk out in front of her car, and she was about to hit the subject. She suddenly swerved over to the right side of the road and was thankful that nobody was there. As she was making the turn, she got a good look at the figure and suddenly realized that it was not a person, but a strange creature. As she sat there for a moment, she looked into her rearview mirror and realized that the creature had gotten behind her car. I looked into the rearview mirror and I saw it leap across my trunk. While still pulled over on the roadside, the woman remained seated in her car trying to regain her composure. She could not believe what had just occurred. Seconds later, she looked up to see the creature now on her right side running quickly down the middle of another road about 75 feet away. That was the last time she saw it. The entire incident had lasted just several seconds, but enough time for the witness to recall a detailed description of a creature that she was certain was not human or a person in a costume. What she saw in daylight and at very close range was a dark-colored, hair-covered man, light creature which she estimated was at least six feet tall or slightly taller. The creature which walked upright on two legs had a head that was said to be large and elongated and covered with hair that just looked wild. The neck was somewhat hard to explain since it was covered in hair. The witness said that it appeared to be thin and long. The neck looked strange because the head was big and the shoulders were wide. The face was mainly covered in hair, yet the area that was exposed appeared to be very white. There was hair coming out from all over the face, like that of a dog or a wolf. The nose was flat and dark, but was also mostly covered in hair. The mouth could not clearly be seen. The ears were not seen since they were covered with hair as well. The eyes were the most prominent feature that really caught the witness's attention. The eyes were at least twice the size of a human, circular in shape. The eyes were dark, possibly black in color, wide-set, and wild-looking. There was no iris, no whites. The witness thinks that is why the eyes looked so odd. The wild look and the fierceness of the eyes of the creature scared the woman. The creature was stocky and muscular in appearance. The chest area was described as thick and hairy. The shoulders were wide and rounded. The arms were very long, hanging down to the knees or beyond. The witness said the hair on the arms was long, like ape hair. The woman didn't recall seeing any muscles. However, it appeared as though it was muscular and in good physical shape. The witness had the impression that this creature was older in age. Very little detail was observed below the waist. There was no unusual sound or odor noted during the observation. The witness did have her windows up and the air conditioner on. At the scene, Dave Dragasin sketched an illustration of the creature under the direction of the eyewitness. Eric and the witness's husband searched a wooded area not far from the location of the encounter, but nothing of interest was found. We also went over to examine the car. As I was looking over the car body, I noticed what appeared to be an unusual scratch mark on the trunk surface on the left side of the vehicle. I pointed it out to the others, as well as the woman and her husband. They had never seen this surface area damage before. 
The affected area was about six inches from the left tail light to the first striation of the scratches. The scratched area was about 8.5 inches long. In two inches wide, there were numerous vertical and horizontal very thin scratch lines that went into the paint surface. There is a possibility that this might be related to the creature's movements as it leaped across the trunk area from that side. It was my impression that the witness was very sincere and competent. As she described to us what she had seen and experienced that night, it was evident that she was still emotionally upset by what had occurred. The witness told me that after the encounter, she drove down the road a short distance and parked her car. She sat there thinking about what had happened. She was trying to convince herself that this was a person, but realized that it couldn't have been. These are her reasons why she feels it was not a human. A. The rate of speed the figure came across into the path of her car. It didn't care that it was going to get hit. B. The fast movement of the creature and the way it leaped over the trunk. She also had a good look at the creature and some facial features. The eyes of the creature frightened her. When she arrived home, she waited a little while before telling her family about what she had seen. She was initially met with some disbelief from her children. Her husband listened to her and believed that she had seen something. He told her she should call the police to see if anyone else had reported something similar. The witness said she was not calling the police, concerned that she would be ridiculed. The direction that the creature was last observed moving towards would take it into a heavily wooded area in the direction of Jumanville. There has been a long history of Bigfoot sightings being reported for many years in this same general area of Fayette County. Back when I was much younger, single-digit ages, I like in a duplex with a nice large yard that backed up to a set of woods. I used to like wandering said woods, and it was also a shortcut to our local armory. One day my friend and I decided to venture into the woods at night. We had some cheap flashlights for our only light, followed by the moon. We ventured past the armory exit trail deeper into the woods, now mined past this point there weren't any houses. We continued to go deeper, not too sure what, if anything, we were looking for. Out of boredom, we decided to turn back and head home. As we turn, we hear so soon. Slightly confused and intrigued, we answer back, yes, why should we stay? After a short time, we get silent. So we continue about our way back to our homes. The friend suddenly feels a tug on his pant leg. He looks down and sees a disturbing upper body of a child. He says it was from waist up and it was reaching up, tugging on his pant leg. I don't really buy it at the time, but a bit freaked out, we then run back home. He tells me what he saw and demands the next day we go back and see if we can experience something else. Next day, later in the night, we head back to the woods around the same spot we went the night prior. Instead of impatience, we decide to continue to wait. We begin to hear twigs snapping in the bot so far distance of the woods. Sounds like something crawling toward us. A bit scared, we turn to where the noise is coming from, flash our lights in the direction, and now we both see the same thing, simply the upper body of a child around our ages. Stunned, we can't move and just watch this thing crawl closer to us until we hear his mom yell our names. At the time, we thought her voice shouting for us was scarier than what we saw. We were kids afraid of consequences, so we ran back home. Now, the best way to describe what we saw was an upper body, no legs or anything below the waist, scratched, tattered clothing, but the body looked fresh, no rot or decay. It looked like a kid, maybe. Between six, eight, to this day, we still have no idea what it was, and sadly, the area we used to roam has been developed in townhouses and shit, so we may never know what it was. The year, not certain, mid-90s, so 95 or 96 late summer. Location was Alliance, Ohio. I'm Matt, a police officer from Iowa. As a seasoned police officer, I've led numerous search and rescue missions but this one would etch itself into my memory forever. 
It all started when a hiker was reported missing in the vast wilderness that borders our town. The search team I led was combing through the dense underbrush when one of my officers stumbled upon a smartphone half buried under a pile of leaves. The battery was nearly dead, but once charged, it revealed a series of photos and videos that sent chills down our spines. The lost hiker had captured images of the surrounding woods, but it was the videos that were truly unsettling. They showed shaky footage of what appeared to be a massive, hairy figure moving between the trees, resembling the legendary Sasquatch. The final video was a frantic, whispered plea for help, with a figure looming in the background. Skeptical but intrigued, we employed every modern technology at our disposal. Drones equipped with thermal imaging flew over the forest, while officers on the ground used GPs tracking to map out a strategy. Our efforts led us to a hidden network of caves, previously undocumented and perfectly concealed by the natural landscape. Inside, we found a man who looked as though he had stepped out of time itself. His beard was long and unkempt, his clothes tattered and faded. He was the survivalist long thought to have perished in these woods. With a mixture of relief and bewilderment, he recounted his tale of chasing after what he believed was a Sasquatch, only to get hopelessly lost. The caves had become his refuge, his home away from civilization. His story was met with skepticism. We had no evidence of Sasquatch's existence, only the ramblings of a man who had spent too much time in isolation. We helped him back to civilization, promising to keep an eye on the area, but privately doubting we'd find anything more. The following day, I decided to patrol the area myself. The woods were eerily silent, the only sound my own footsteps crunching on the forest floor. I was about to turn back, convinced there was nothing to find, when a movement caught my eye. Standing there in a clearing bathed in the soft light of the setting sun was the unmistakable figure of what could only be described as a Sasquatch. It was massive, covered in thick, dark fur, and it stared right at me with a deep, intelligent gaze before disappearing into the woods. In that moment, all skepticism vanished. The reality of what I had seen struck me with a force that left me reeling. I stood there for what felt like hours, trying to comprehend the encounter. I had always believed in what I could see, touch, and explain. But here, in the heart of the wilderness, I was faced with a mystery that defied all logic. The search for the missing hiker eventually concluded with their safe return, but the experience left a lasting impression on me. The world is full of mysteries, some hidden deep within the shadows of our planet's oldest forest. As for the survivalist, he became a source of invaluable knowledge about living off the grid, though he never stopped believing, or searching, for the creature that led him astray. As for me, I patrol the woods with a new sense of wonder and respect, ever mindful of the mysteries that dwell just beyond the veil of our understanding. The image of the Sasquatch etched into my memory serves as a reminder of the endless possibilities that exist in the unexplored corners of the world. It was September 18. My dad's friend had a dogman that killed his dog. He was a 130-pound dog, and his wife's uncle gave her that dog. Before he had passed, and she promised him that she would take care of it. The dog one night knew something was out there, so he was just barking like crazy. He had gotten out, and the next morning, and they found the dog dead on their porch with the guts ripped out. Justin put the dog somewhere else, and when he came to get the dog because he was going to bury it, but when he got there, the dog was gone. He checked his trail camera, and he saw the dogman. He had pictures, but I did not have the pictures of the dogman. His wife was very upset. One morning, around 6 a.m., about two years ago, I was living not far from Washington, D.C. A friend of a friend needed a roommate to afford the rent for an apartment he had found. So when I was told about this, my first thought was, oh yeah, here's my chance to move out of my parents' house. 
After about six months of living in the area, I noticed that on certain nights, I would hear loud roars in the distance. I could never tell how far away the noise was coming from. It would sometimes sound nearby or just far enough away where I wouldn't mind being outside to see what it might be making the sound from a safe distance. I lived in a quiet, wooded area. A lot of people lived in the area. I actually lived within five minutes walking distance away from the University of Maryland. One morning around 6 a.m., I just snapped awake from a deep sound sleep for no reason at all. I started to go back to sleep but thought to myself, why am I wide awake and alert? It was strange. I was completely awake. Then, right in my backyard, I heard a low, deep growl. That's when I knew something was up. The moment I heard that, I knew. That was why I woke up. I remained quiet and didn't move for the next five to ten minutes, as this thing started to become very active in my backyard. It went from the low growls to heavy breathing. This thing's lungs had to be massive because it sounded the same exact way a horse would if you were standing right next to it. When it breathed through its nose, it sounded more like a horse. But this thing sounded like it was aggressive. I knew it wasn't a horse in the backyard. That wouldn't be possible, but what I saw was very real. It literally ran from my backyard into the dividing fence of my backyard, from my neighbor's backyard, again and again. It made no sense for it to be doing that. It would often stop and sniff around and sneeze very loudly. It sounded like it was right next to my window and I was on the second floor. I didn't want to look out the window because I thought that there is no way in the world no one else is hearing this right now but me. I thought this thing is trying to get my attention on purpose. I stayed still in bed without moving and I was beyond scared. I really thought it was a werewolf even before I saw it. I always thought that they were real. The guys that lived below me started yelling and screaming, El Diablo! Over and over again they yelled that. I could hear the thing leaving the backyard, so I hurried to try and get a look at it. When I did, all I saw was its backside. This thing was massive with broad shoulders like a bodybuilder, and it had ears sticking up on its head. It slowly walked away until I lost sight of it, When I was in high school, my friends and I would walk to a local 24-7 cafe about two miles away from my house at all hours of the night. Sometimes we would walk down the street. Other times we would cut through the woods. We would always be in groups of at least four, so it was never intimidating or creepy until one night when we decided to cut through the woods. We were about 20 feet away from exiting the trail and onto the road when there was a bright flash, followed by a high-pitched ringing similar to an old Polaroid camera. I was staring at the ground when it happened and from the angle of my shadow I could tell it came from above and behind us. There were about five of us and we all took a few more steps before one of my buddies said, did anyone else see that? And right after he said, that we heard a man coughing from a tree behind us. Needless to say, we all hauled ass to the cafe and took the roads back home. This was in 2003. We were in a helicopter on a rescue mission. We were going to land in this valley right next to a large mountain around 4,200 meters high. There was intelligence that the enemy was hiding out there. So naturally, they were our targets for being seen by us. When we got very close to the landing zone, this 200 meter long cavern opened up under the helicopter's path. I was a gunner at the time, so I was one of the first ones to see this. It looked like a black hole and it happened so fast that we could have been hit by accident if we weren't careful about our surroundings. Luckily, none of us died from it. There were supposed to be five enemy combatants in this cavern with their wives and kids. These things were anywhere between seven to nine feet tall and certainly not enemy soldiers. They had greenish yellow scaly skin, huge fangs, long claws, and looked like damn abominations from a Frankenstein monster. They also had webbed hands and claws 
Our pilot saw this coming. We used our searchlights and lit up the cavern nicely before landing. They were pretty upset, or so they seemed, and, and immediately began chasing after the copter. The pilot tried taking off again, and we began shooting at these things. They screamed like demons, wanted to take down our chopper, and with all the gunfire going on, the helicopter began to spin out of control, nearly crashing. We had to battle these things for a good while, but we were finally able to kill them all using a combination of ammo and grenades. We lost several good men. We had to retreat on the mission to escape what was going on here. We were able to get a hold of a company, and a chopper came in for us about three hours later because we hid. We managed to stay alive. I don't know exactly how we managed to survive this, but we did, and it wasn't because of me so much as the other guys on my squad. They were the true heroes, to be sure. I just wanted to do my duty and help. This is what happened during the battle, though. It turns out that these things were an ancient breed of mutated humans who lived in the mountains long ago. There are reports of them being worshipped by ancient cults. This is what I've been told by other fellow veterans who have had their own stories with these creatures as well. During this time in Afghanistan, there are even men during Desert Storm that talk about large humanoid beings who hide under the sand and who have attacked and devoured convoys whole. Pretty terrifying stuff out there in the desert. My uncle is a commercial fisherman and I have gone out with him to do a few squid seasons. You fish at night in total darkness and use lights to get the squid to come up and mate so you can swoop them up. Multiple times, big animals came to the surface and took out hundreds of pounds of the catch, and every damn time it scared the hell out of me. Most of the time, it's sperm whales, but there was one time we both saw what we thought was like a bright spotted orange or red giant jellyfish looking thing. Go over a group of them like a net and just made them disappear before diving back down. It freaked my uncle out so much, guy's been fishing for 45 plus years now, that he called all the other boats and tells the story all the time now. He's convinced we saw a new species of sea creature. I was driving home from work on Route 66 near the Green Gage Mall around 9 p.m. when my headlights suddenly picked up a large canid-looking creature darting across the road. As it reached the side of the road, it swiftly dropped to all fours and skillfully crawled under a fence that encircled a power transformer. I couldn't believe my eyes. This creature had a snout like a dog and was completely covered in hair. My curiosity got the better of me, so I decided to pull over, grabbed my trusty flashlight, and cautiously made my way around the fence site. To my surprise, I discovered a dugout area that was about two feet deep, right at the fence's edge. I would have been around 12, 13 at the time, and on a deep-sea fishing trip with a family group, Somebody spotted what looked like a body floating about 70 feet or so from the boat. It was pretty indistinct at that distance, but it was fleshy colored and large enough to be an adult human. I could also see what looked like a couple of rib bones sticking out of it. We pointed it out to the skipper who checked it out with his binoculars and claimed it was a dead seal. He then stashed the binoculars back in the wheelhouse and refused to let anyone else take a look through them. The skipper went a bit quiet after that, and the body gradually floated away from us and out of sight, and we thought no more of it until later when we were on our way back in at the end of the day. The skipper out of nowhere started telling us about the time he found a body of a young woman at sea. He had taken out a group of mentally handicapped kids for a boat trip when he found her. He recovered the body by netting it and tying it to the side of the boat before heading in. This completely freaked the kids out on the boat, and he said he found the whole experience to be deeply traumatic. To make things worse, he was accused by the girl's family of stealing a bracelet from the body, and 
ended up being questioned by the police. It turned out that the bracelet was there all along, but just not immediately visible because of how bloated the body had become. He finished by telling us that if he ever found another body at sea, he would leave it where it was. I have always wondered exactly what he saw through those binoculars. I have a very strange walking trail encounter with an invisible two-legged very large thing while walking with my dog. Some of the trail sections have wooded areas alongside of the walking paths, so most of the trail has woods on one side of the path and the park is on the other side of the trail. The wooded area is not very large, I would guess about 300 feet by half a mile, so I don't consider it a forest, I just call it the woods. The wooded area of the park has three or four small creeks, and I think only one of the creeks has some water. Most of the trees are beautiful and normal tall trees, and some of the trees here and there look like they're dead. There's always people and kids going down there to ride bikes, hang out, and whatever else they do. One day around 4 p.m., I took my female dog, Bertha, for our normal everyday walk. We had just gotten off the car and began our walk. We were probably walking on the trail for about five minutes or so when I started feeling weird after a turn. No, not scared or afraid. I started to feel happy and my little pain aches had disappeared. This was very strange because I remember saying to myself inside my head, not out loud, I said, wow, I feel good. I feel like a little kid. I feel brand new. It was only about 20 seconds of this young and joyful feeling when all of a sudden something had let go of a large bush that it was holding on to. The thing sounded like it was intertwined in the bush, like holding on and trying to hide. At the same time of the noise in the bush, Bertha turned towards the bush and started going after it. I had Bertha on a leash and she was dragging me, almost taking me into the woods. I had to hold her back because I couldn't see what was making all that noise. It moved through another tall bush and started stepping heavy with loud thumps. I think it fell when it made it out of the bush area. The thing was only about 15 feet away from us on the other side of the bushes and sounded like two very large horses stomping on the ground. I could see the bushes and the grass moving, but I could not see anything. We moved back away from a trail a few feet so I can see a clearing on the other side of the bushes to try to see this thing. I looked right where the sounds of steps were coming from and saw nothing. So I looked down on the ground and I could see where two feet were stepping on the tall grass. I remember I said to myself in my head, no way that is not an invisible monster. After I said that I heard something, I will never forget. The thing started making loud T-Rex stomps. Then I said out loud, That sounds like T-Rex. From the movies, I recall, I could feel the stomps on the ground. Bertha and I were just looking into the woods at this sound. I can feel my eardrums shaking bad, and both eardrums felt like busted speakers. In my head, I said, It's trying to blow my eardrum. The T-Rex stomps lasted about 10 or 15 seconds. Then the sound stopped it, just turned off like a light switch. I have no idea if it jumped into something or it vanished. It is strange because after all that I still felt happy with no worry or fear at all. Just very curious. I really wanted to see it. On the way home, I remember thinking. Any other day, I would have been afraid and ran away from it. I heard this thing three or four times in the following days. In another section of woods, I could hear someone heavy walking on leaves just inside the tree line about 30 feet away in the woods, alongside me in Bertha. I would hear it, and I would stop without turning to it. And it would take a step or two, and it would stop. I turned around a few times to see nothing because it wasn't moving. I did this a few times to make sure. I would tell myself in my head, if a person stays on trail, they have no permission to take you. I think one time I heard his steps in the woods next to me. I said to myself in my head, I think it wants me to make a mistake and go into the woods towards it. After I said that I never heard it again, 
I'm sure it can hear what I'm thinking. Just a few weeks ago, I'd seen something very strange related to this thing. Bertha and I were walking in the same part of the trail, only about 100 feet away from my first encounter where the bushes were. I stopped to look into the woods at this view into the woods. I was standing still looking past the trees, how the area was covered in a few inches of light green grass. I was looking kinda downhill how the woods go down in and around the creek down there. I said to myself, it looks beautiful. The trees, the color of greens, and the sunlight and shadow. It looks like a postcard, perfect, about two or three seconds after I thought that. While I was just looking down at this area of woods, I saw a big human-shaped blur move between two trees about 80 feet away. I saw it for a split second. It was big, maybe 10 feet tall. Big head, big wide muscle shoulders, and I remember his big left leg. I remember his left knee and big muscle above it, the laterals. I could see the thick, shiny hair on the leg. Yes, this thing looked exactly like the Predator from the movie when he is cloaked. It is very weird how my brain was able to capture this image. My memory surprised me. His shoulders, his head, and the side of his back was reflecting the woods between him and me. It looked like a male, not a female. I was surprised just like him. In my opinion, I think he took off running because he thought I was sensing that he was in the area. But I had no idea he was there. I think he knows Bertha. Can't pick up on him if he hides a little farther away from the trail. I am very cautious when we go walking near woods now. I also tell people where I'm going and carry a few extra things hidden on me. I have no idea why this thing got so close to me or what its intentions were. And I also don't know why it ran away from me those times. Was there something or someone behind me that startled it? These occurrences were a very incredible time of my life. It changed me in a good way. I often think I don't know, but maybe that's why dogs are on this planet, to help us and pick up on these invisible things when they get too close. Always be happy and do the things you love doing in your life. Have no worries and certainly no fear. I hope my story helps people to be alert and careful out there in this world. In June of 2006, four of us were on a training mission north of Camp Lejeune near the town of Jacksonville. We pulled off next to a field and all went down into the field, laid around for about an hour after taking in the sun. Being out in the brush for most of the morning, there was nothing but woods as far as you could see, even behind us. No traffic, no sounds of really any kind. We didn't think too much about it since we were taking a break. There was a rise in the field that I had to stand up to look over. As soon as I stood up, I saw what looked like two black things laying down on the edge of the wood line about 200 yards away. As soon as they saw me, they stood up and they started walking off at a brisk pace. I immediately drew my moor carbine and told everybody else to stay low. I fired off one round towards them at their feet, which is what I was taught to do if you were trying to get somebody's attention. The two subjects immediately began sprinting towards the woods, which only made me now more nervous. I was taught that you don't run from somebody trying to contact you. After they disappeared, I told everybody else to stand up. We all took off for our vehicles. We didn't say much after until we got back to base. The next day, we got together and talked about what had happened. We agreed that the subjects were both male and they were both around five, eight to six feet tall. They ran like track athletes or soldiers, not like lumbering large people who are overweight. One of the guys on our team was a good shot. We all decided that he would be the one who would shoot the subject if we ever ran into them again. He's six, two, around 215 pounds, and in good shape. The next time we went on a training mission, there were only four of us instead of five, so somebody stayed behind for some reason. We were out there for almost three days. We got back to camp on a Friday night, and everybody was eager to get home for the weekend. On Saturday, we all went down into town to eat. I didn't say much about what had happened, just that I felt uneasy being out there alone without a team. 
One of the guys on our team, let's call him Sam, was really freaked out by it and did not want to ever go back into that field again. He told me he heard moaning sounds coming from the woods while we were out there. When I asked him if he thought they could have been animals, he said no, that it was too loud and sounded like it came from two different people. I didn't really know what to say since I had only heard the sounds once, when I stood up quickly but never when lying down in the grass like we had. I had no idea he had heard them. Sam was convinced that there were people out there. He wanted me to tell a team leader about it. I told him that I would tell him about it the next time we went out on a training mission. He was really scared, so he wanted to go back and investigate further with me. I informed him no. About a week later, we were all at the team leader's house waiting for him to get home from work, and I told him about what had happened. They laughed at first, but none of them had heard the moaning sounds or seen anything on their patrols. The team leader, let's call him Rich, told us that he did not want us to come back out there without a full team of people just in case it was true. I agreed with him and was glad that he felt that way. I can see that so far nothing has happened yet, but I'll let you know as soon as we do. Last note, I believe the two figures we saw were juvenile or adolescent Sasquatch, seemingly caught off guard. I've never encountered a Wendigo, but when I was staying out in Arizona with a friend, I heard some very, very strange sounds in the desert. My friend couldn't hear them, but I clearly heard what sounded like a child crying or squealing. I went out to the back patio of the trailer we were in and listened hard, and it creeped me out infinitely when I could still hear the sound. Exactly the same, never changing pitch or cadence. My friend, even standing right where my feet were planted, still could not hear the sounds. I thought I was going nuts. The next day, I related my experience to Gary, an older relative of my friend who related to me an encounter. He had almost 30 years before that day. Gary told me about how he lived on the outskirts of a reservation where people had gone missing in alarming amounts. No mass disappearances at one time, but a steady increase in missing persons, reports that left tribal law enforcement and local law enforcement at odds with one another and very suspicious that a serial killer may be on the loose. During a joint investigation, both law agencies went house to house interviewing residents close to where most of the people were last seen, asking them what kind of information they could provide. When they got to where Gary was staying, they were asking questions about strange sounds and sighting in the mountainous area directly next to the reservation. Gary thought it was odd, but informed them that once in a while, he'd hear a child crying out near the entrance to the mountain trail and go out in his truck looking to see if anyone was lost. He never saw any people, but noted that the usually buzzing surroundings were so still that it unnerved him. One night in particular, Gary said he saw what looked like sick stag in the woods not far up the path leading to the start of the mountain trail. He said it was pale with visible antlers and it looked like it was laying down on its front hooves and struggling to get up. Gary explained that he stepped out of his truck with his flashlight, turned to grab his rifle, and by the time he looked back up the trail, the stag was gone. It was at this point where a stench so foul overtook him that his eyes stung and he involuntarily gagged and had to hold back his dinner. He described it as an earthy, sticky, palpable musk smell that had a sweet after stench to it. He also said it smelled like rotted meat and copper. He was immediately beset with a feeling of mortal dread and had to contain his panic as he jumped back into his truck. He said as he was backing up to leave the narrow trail, he heard clear as day, almost as if it was right in the truck with him, a child's cry. Only this close, I sounded more like a powerful wail that was impossible for a child to emit. He hightailed it out of there and was in the process of looking for a new place to live. He said he had trouble sleeping for a while after that night due to constant nightmares of things banging on his windows. After he told the police this account, he said the two officers looked at one another, shared some kind of nonverbal interaction, 
thanked him for his time, and asked him to call the station instantly if he heard any strange sounds or saw anything. Before they left, he said he asked them how many other people reported seeing or hearing something similar to what he just told them. They responded that at least one person from each house they visited reported hearing children crying in the night with other residents of the same household claiming to never have heard or seen anything unusual. They also said that at least one other person they interviewed had seen a pale-looking creature on the mountain, which they thought was a big cat of some sort. What impacted Gary the most, though, was when one of the tribal officers told him that, while interviewing the family of a missing person, they related that in the weeks leading up to their child's disappearance, their child had been suffering from nightmares of demon deer. Outside of their window and drew many pictures of what it looked like. Gary asked if they had the pictures, and the officer produced a Polaroid taken of the drawing. It looked almost exactly like what he'd seen that night on the Mount Rail, pale, skinny, big antlers, except this drawing had features he was fortunate to not have seen in person. Huge red eyes, sharp bloody teeth and claws, and a black hole next to it with arms sticking out of it. Gary moved two days after this. After Gary finished telling me that story, he laughed heartily, probably at the horrified expression on my face. He said, don't worry, as long as you don't follow the cries, you will be all right. I've never forgotten that story. I admit that Gary could very well have been pranking me because he was a jokester, but no one else in the home seemed to be amused when he told me the story, and his demeanor was very serious. I believe that he experienced what he related because I heard the cries in the night for myself, clear as crystal, while my friend heard nothing, even while I was actively listening to the wailing of a child crying. I was around nine years old or so and was at my mom's friend's house because they were having a little get-together. My mom's best friend at the time decided to go get something which was at a house nearby down a dirt road in the woods. My mom's friend decided to take my friend and me with her. I wish I had never gone with her. We rode with her over there and when she got out my friend and I stayed in her car and waited for her to come back. After sitting in her car for ten minutes, we decided to get out to see what was taking her so long. When we did that, she told us to get back in the car, so we did. As it turned out, she was buying weed, so we weren't welcome in the house. So my buddy and I got back in her car and waited for her to come out. They had a lot of bulldogs at that property. The dogs had all been barking like crazy and then just stopped all at once and went into their dog houses. That's when my friend and I saw this thing that looked like some kind of werewolf coming from behind the car. We froze and just stared at it as it walked by. Wow, it looked so demonic. When we saw it, we ducked down and laid on the floorboards. We laid there for what seemed like forever until we heard my mom's friend hitting on the driver's window, trying to get us to let her in. I guess it left when it heard her come out of the house or something. I'm a 32-year-old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Thomason Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park. I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including coy dogs and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes. I was a Dino. Crazy little girl. 
My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing, but I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I'd never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say it sounded like it? No one was home. No media was on. And yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose. But when I'd go out to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say, when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky treak. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. So, the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping, too. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psychoapalooza mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled. A few times trying, she was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho, I noticed my other six were across the road. 
They were standing in a tiny little fence, an area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse, Cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral. The last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had a Palooza's, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, mares, and geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses. I was rehabbing a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD and a racking horse that actually took me three years to touch without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls and all but one were mares. Mares are extremely moody and two of mine were particularly vicious to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass, that was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead him out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest of butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay throughout, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking it's the appy flipping out. That's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panic gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to see by. The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid, as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first. 
to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees in my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white so I could see a dim lighting. From my flashlight on the one it was next to, this thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though. So, I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching, frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times, I one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with a bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at his house. Altars and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know. I should have left the tack. I also know you're not supposed to run. But I couldn't even conceive what I'd just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there, in the shadows? while I was trying to catch her, or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through to get to the road. Was it the reason the epi swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line, away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning. But I will say the epi mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that. My mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were non-bipedal things going on too. I miss it terribly. 
Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the eye shine event. I didn't see the actual creature and really, how do you convey that unnatural or horror-inducing feeling? You saw eye shine, whoop de do. My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. I live near London, United Kingdom, in Surrey. I once had a neighbor who had been a convicted bank robber. He'd spent a lot of time in prison over the years. Often in high-security jails, he was forced to wear what were known as patches, which meant high-visibility clothing to try and prevent escape. He told me this story one night, and it's always stayed with me. During one of his many incarcerations spent at Her Majesty's Pleasure in the 1970s, his cellmate was a practicing Satanist. They got to talking about his beliefs one night, and the Satanist said he wanted to show my neighbor something. He said, I'm going to raise something from the other side, but don't stare at it. Stay still, take a look for a second or two, then look away. He drew something in chalk on the cell floor chanted something and built a small fire with a few matches. My friend said he saw a small figure composed of the smoke manifest from the fire, move around the floor for a few seconds, as if it had weight or mass. Then it dissipates. It totally freaked him out, and he wasn't a man that would scare easily. He said he trod carefully around his cellmate from then on, and was quite relieved when his sentence came to an end. Back in 1992, we lived near Palm Springs, California. At the time, our kids were in karate classes. Their instructor and I would converse now and then. I told him about my beliefs in the paranormal and UFOs. One evening, he said, Man, you should meet my brother. You and him would get along great, and he could tell you some stuff, too. So his brother and I talked on the phone. But he was hesitant to talk much on the phone, but said he'd be happy to meet in person at his brother's house. As it ended up, he was a retired military service veteran who was stationed at the infamous Groom Lake. As his story goes, one night at the tavern, one of his co-workers lost it. He started rambling on about aliens, vehicles, and technology being applied. He tried to hush his partner up, and before he knew it, the senior level MP and man in black came in and escorted his partner out. That was the last time he ever saw him again. So let's just say this. It's all really going down, man. I have no reason to doubt the instructor's brother, especially because of the way we met. My girlfriend's father-in-law told me a story. He was roofing a house on Vancouver Island near a fish hatchery on the Cowichan River. He was with some native guys. Every night before dark, they would leave early. They didn't want to be around when Sasquatch came to fish in the river. It will chuck rocks at you. He knew a native woman on the island who was willing to share her stories from her youth and her tribe. She said the tribe has a secret society of women singers. Part of the initiation ritual is for the new singer to go into the long house and fast for a spirit vision. This is done to learn what animal will be your sacred spirit for your singing. She was starving and crying because of her hunger. Then she heard something jump down onto the roof of the longhouse. She heard it walk along the smoke hole. She looked up and a Sasquatch was looking down at her. It then lowered a freshly killed deer down through the smoke hole, dropped it by the fire and left. So her spirit became the Sasquatch. The native woman, who I will not name nor her tribe, lived along the Semenus River as a child. She remembers the Sasquatch would run beside their house and bang on with its hand, scaring everyone. Her uncle also saw one on the Nanaimo River. She thinks they come down out of the mountains when the water runs low up there in late summer and also to fish when the runs are going on. 
She says her sister now hears them in her yard at night. They bang on the ground and make this big pounding noise. This all started after her tribe was given permission to begin logging on their land. Last year, my girlfriend and I were camping at Sasquatch Provincial Park, and on the first night, about 3 a.m., I got up to relieve myself. I got back in the tent, and I heard a distinct two-tone call way off in the distance, followed by answering calls of at least two more. One was mid-distance, and one on the mountain right above our campsite. This went on for 40 minutes. We declared a no-phones camp out, so I was not carrying any equipment. I woke my girlfriend and we listened to it. It was like they were letting each other know they were there. I jokingly called it a Sasquatch roll call. We later listened to tons of wildlife calls and the only thing that matched was from John Binder Nagel's investigation of mysterious calls in a native community up Vancouver Island. The kids in the campsite beside us started mimicking it. I got up, banged on a tree with a stick and it stopped. My native friend told me you got the knuck wrong. I've heard from other natives that tree banging is a bad idea as it's a territorial signal, so I may not do that anymore. It sounds legit to me. I commute for my job. It's a retail job, but I live in a rural area in the Southern California foothills, and it is currently my only option. I drive home every night near 1 a.m. I take the highway. It's always deserted at these times, and some nights were more peculiar than others, but nothing so extreme as this incident. It's not uncommon for me to see a lot of wildlife on these drives. I would just take it slow and be alert. Occasionally, I'd see a black-tailed deer, coyotes, raccoons, etc. One recent night, I was only about 10 minutes away from home. I rolled up to the usual four-way stop that I'd stopped at hundreds of times before. Not a soul around. As I came to a complete stop, I saw something standing just off the side of the road across from the intersection. It was obviously an animal, and it was headed toward the road, so I was going to wait for it to cross. It took me a second to really comprehend what it was at first. I thought it was a horse which, although dangerous, wouldn't be that uncommon for where I live due to irresponsible ranchers and their constantly broken fences. Then, as I started to be able to make out more of what it was as it neared the light from my headlights, I realized something was very wrong with this animal. It was tall, so much so that the legs looked stilt-like. As I sat there, shocked it slowly, stepped into the road, and came across my car's direct beam of my headlight. At this point, I realized two things. One, it was much taller than my car. Its height was monstrous. Two, its gait was very odd, almost like it didn't know how to properly walk as a deer should. It was like all of its joints wanted to bend the wrong way. It moved slowly into the oncoming lane and then swiveled its head to look back at me. All of the hair on my body rose. What spooked me the most was that this was certainly a deer, or at least something that looked like one. It looked normal in every way except the spider-like legs it was standing on. At this point, I guessed it, and then the deer stood unmoving as my car sped past by. I looked back in my rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of it crossing the oncoming lane back into the shoulder of the highway, illuminated red by my brake lights. When I got home, I ran into my house and locked myself in. I'm still understandably freaked out. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.